Okay, let's start. Good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Paola Monti from uh, Fondazione De Benedetti. I will be sharing the next uh, session. Um, we are a bit behind, so let's start immediately. <laughs> um, the next session will, um, will be about the students without schools and women without work, the legacy of COVID-19 in Italy. Uh, this is a joint work by Tito Boeri from uh, Fondazione De Benedetti e Bocconi University, Maria De Paola um, from uh, uh, IMSS, the Italian Social Security Administration, uh, by Salvatore Lattanzio um, from University of Cambridge, and from, uh, by uh, Paolo Pinotti from uh, Bocconi University and Fondazione De Benedetti. Uh, so, Salvatore is uh, the first speaker. And uh, overall, you have about 40 minutes. Okay. Uh, so the floor uh, is yours. Okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, so this part of the report is um, uh, exactly about uh, uh, the consequences of the pandemic on students and parents in, uh, in Italy. Uh, and uh, we start by uh, observing that uh, school closures were the uh, first policy measures adopted by government to contain the spread of the, of the virus. Uh, and uh, uh, of course, there were reopenings after summer breaks in, uh, in September. Uh, and then during the second wave, there were uh, other school closures, which were uh, a bit heterogeneous across uh, different uh, regions. And, uh, um, uh, in, in different uh, uh, countries. So the focus of this uh, part of the report is going to be uh, Italy, but uh, let's say that uh, what we say about Italy can be also extended to some extent to other countries that had similar policies in terms of uh, school closures, which could be total or uh, partial. So Italy is actually uh, one of the countries that kept schools closed for the longer period during the first wave. So in this graph, uh, uh, we see the number of uh, days uh, during which schools were closed across a number of European countries. And basically what we see is that Italy uh, was the country that for the longest period had schools completely uh, closed. Uh, whereas in other countries there were some, at least, uh, let's say, interaction between uh, uh, school partially and uh, uh, completely uh, closed. Uh, during the second wave, there is also uh, a great heterogeneity in the number of uh, days uh, during which schools were closed uh, across uh, Italian regions. So for uh, non-Italians, uh, regions uh, are the largest administrative uh, units within the country. And basically here uh, on the x-axis in this graph, we have uh, the different uh, Italian regions. On the y-axis, we have the number of days that uh, basically the second and third grade of the middle school uh, was closed with the distinction between uh, uh, the, um, uh, the number of days, sorry, the number of days in which schools were in presence and the number of days in which there was uh, distance or remote uh, learning. And we see that in some regions, uh, one uh, in particular Campania, uh, the majority of days teaching was uh, performed uh, in, a, in a remote uh, setting. So the outline of the report today is about first looking at the benefits of school closures in terms of the containment of the virus in Italy. So we are going to see what are the positive health effects of uh, school closures. Uh, and then the second and the third part is about uh, uh, investigating the costs of uh, school closures, both in terms of labor market opportunities, especially for uh, women and women with children, and third, uh, also on uh, students' uh, achievement. So I start with the uh, first part about the impact of schools on the transmission of uh, COVID-19. And uh, uh, the literature on uh, the uh, uh, effect of uh, respira respiratory diseases on, um, on the transmission of respiratory diseases on, in schools uh, was 
uh, let's say, quite substantial before the advent of COVID. Um, and there are in particular a couple of papers that look at both the costs of keeping schools closed in order to contain the spread of this kind of viruses uh, and at the benefits in terms of reduced opportunities of contagion. And basically the consensus before COVID was that there was usually a short run uh, benefits in keeping school, schools closed in terms of reducing the uh, probability of contagion for both students and uh, older individuals, uh, but that the costs would outrun the benefits after uh, some period of time. The costs in terms of reduced um, uh, educational opportunities for students. With the advent of COVID, there was a rush to, uh, let's say, understand what were the consequences of uh, keeping schools clo closed on, uh, on contagion, and the evidence is uh, mixed. There is some evidence on Germany, for example, that shows that uh, school reopenings after summer breaks in uh, uh, September of last year uh, didn't bring about more uh, cases in regions where schools open early. An opposite evidence is present for the United States that shows that actually schools do contribute to uh, the spread of uh, COVID-19. So here today we are going to add a piece of evidence to this literature by looking at the specific case of Italy. Uh, and let me say up front that uh, the evidence that I'm going to show is going to be uh, relative to 2020, so to a pre-vaccination world, uh, and that this, um, let's say that the results that uh, we show today uh, may not be true and actually hopefully will not be true in a post-vaccination uh, uh, world. Um, so here the, there's a nice map of Italy where uh, each region is uh, uh, colored with a different shade of blue depending on the uh, date of opening. So uh, for the purpose of uh, this presentation, I'm going to focus on the dark blue regions, uh, which, are, which are in the, let's say, center and south of Italy, and in the light blue regions that are in the uh, center and north of Italy. These are the two groups of regions, the dark blue ones that open schools late, so on the 24th of September of last year, and the light blue regions are those that open schools uh, early, so on the 14th of September of last year. And basically what I'm going to do, I'm going to compare the evolution of the epidemic in terms of cases, hospitalization, deaths, uh, in these two uh, groups of uh, regions in a nutshell. So the empirical strategy for the first part uh, will, will be an analysis of school reopenings. So I'm going to perform a difference in differences comparing regions opening schools early versus regions op opening schools late. And I'm going to show basically the evolution of cases in relative terms. So in school, in uh, regions opening schools early relative to regions opening schools uh, late. And I'm going to do that controlling for uh, a number of factors that are region specific and crucially also controlling for mobility differences between regions, which as we learned, uh, can have a substantial impact on the probability of uh, transmission. Then in the second part of this, uh, uh, let's say, first uh, portion of our talk, I'm going to uh, provide an analysis of school closures in Campania. So Campania is one of the biggest uh, Italian regions in the, in the south of Italy. Uh, and uh, uh, basically Campania decided to close schools on the 16th of October, whereas other regions in Italy kept schools open. So for, uh, let's say, a short window of a, of a couple of weeks, we can compare the evolution of the pandemic in Campania relative to a control group uh, uh, of regions, um, exploiting the fact that Campania closed schools and the other regions did not close schools. And I'm going to do that with a synthetic control approach, which basically builds a control, a counterfactual group, group of uh, uh, regions that can be uh, let's say, as comparable as possible to uh, Campania in terms of uh, observable uh, characteristics, which are uh, mainly going to be demographic characteristics of uh, the two groups of regions. So uh, the data that I'm going to use uh, uh, come from Protezione Civile, uh, which uh, records the number of uh, cases, hospitalizations, uh, critical ill patients and deaths in uh, uh, Italian regions for each uh, day. 
uh, I'm going to also exploit a data set from the Italian Association of Epidemiologists that records incidence uh, rates for different age groups. So in order also to say something about uh, how different age groups were affected in particular by uh, school closures. Uh, I'm going to use Google Mobility Reports in order to have information on mobility, uh, on the change in mobility uh, in uh, different Italian regions. And finally, I'm going to uh, exploit demographic information from the uh, National Statistical Institute. So here is uh, a graph of how mobility changed uh, around uh, school uh, openings in uh, uh, regions that uh, open school early on the 14th of September and region, regions that open, open school late, so on the 24th of September. And uh, we can focus uh, uh, mainly on the top left uh, panel of this graph that shows the mobility towards transit stations, so towards uh, stations, bus stops, uh, subways. And basically we see that there is an increase in the uh, mobility uh, in uh, uh, early opening and late opening regions, just let's say around uh, the date of opening of uh, schools in both groups of regions. Then we see that this mobility uh, decreases over time because uh, there are some other policy interventions that were uh, put in place by the government in order to contain the spread of the virus in the second uh, wave. And uh, here I'm going to show the first set of results about the impact of school reopenings uh, where basically, so here each graph shows the difference in the number of cases, hospitalizations, uh, patients in uh, intensive care units and deaths in regions opening schools early versus regions opening schools uh, late. And basically what we see if we focus for, uh, for a moment in the top left, uh, on the top left graph that shows the evolution of uh, new cases, what we see is that before school openings, so before the 14th of, the, of September, uh, there are no significant differences in the number of new cases um, in, the, in the two groups of regions. This holds true also after school openings for approximately 20 to 25 days. Uh, and then we see an increase uh, in the uh, number of uh, new cases in early opening regions relative to late opening regions. And this increase is quite substantial. So it's an increase that is equal to one standard deviation uh, increase in uh, uh, early opening regions relative to uh, the other group. Uh, so this increase may be due uh, to uh, schools. And uh, let's say that, so here we observe a late increase. So uh, at least three weeks have to pass in order, that, uh, in order for the uh, analysis to show some significant effects in this case. Uh, so it could be that, of course, there are some uh, delays in the, no in, the, in the notification of cases, which is a well-known uh, problem, or simply uh, it could be the case that it takes time for the uh, contagion to uh, show up in uh, uh, official statistics, especially if the first group that is hit by contagion is uh, younger people who we know, we, we, we learn to know, that are more likely to present, let's say, light uh, forms of, uh, of contagion. Then the other graphs shows the same uh, uh, let's say patterns for hospitalizations, which also show uh, a significant increase, let's say after 30 days, more or less, which is consistent with hospitalization take, taking more or less five days between uh, the notification of the case. Uh, and uh, luckily, um, uh, we don't see uh, an increase in the number of ICU patients on in the, or in the number of deaths. This could be a positive thing if uh, the majority of people who were uh, let's say, uh, ill were uh, younger people who are also less likely to uh, be uh, in hospital and to die from COVID, or it could be a negative thing, meaning that maybe it takes more time uh, to observe significant effects in uh, uh, critically ill patients or uh, deaths. I cannot go really much, um, let's say, further in time, so uh, besides the 40 days that are shown, because basically, uh, I would be uh, including in the, in the sample a period after November where there was the, 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 the new decree from the Prime Minister that basically established additional policy measures that were uh, introduced in order to contain the spread of the, of the virus. 
Then, uh, in this second graph, uh, what I'm showing is the um, uh, impact of school closures in Campania. So the graph here shows two lines. The black solid line is the evolution of new cases in Campania between, uh, uh, let's say, mid-September until the end of November. And uh, uh, the uh, uh, dotted black uh, line shows the evolution of cases in the synthetic group uh, of regions. So synthetic groups of regions means simply the control group uh, that uh, is built uh, through this uh, uh, methodology. And uh, the vertical lines, the vertical red lines, the first one is on the, uh, corresponds to the 16th of October, so the day in which uh, Campania closed schools. And the second line is the 3rd of November, that is uh, basically the day in which new measures were uh, introduced by the central government. Uh, namely, the, 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 the measures I'm referring to are those relative to the introduction of yellow, orange, and red uh, zones. And basically what we see, we see that there is a diverging path in terms of new cases in Campania relative to the control group after school uh, uh, closures. And this is true also uh, for uh, uh, different age groups, and it's particularly true for the younger age groups. So if I redo the same uh, graph for uh, different age groups, I would observe a difference that is particularly significant for children that are aged between 6 and 13 uh, years old. Um, for the older age groups, the uh, differences are present, but are not really statistically uh, significant. So at least we can say that it seems to have an impact, this, the closures of school, uh, but it seems to have an impact that is uh, much more robust and much more significant for younger children rather than older people uh, that uh, are more likely to develop more severe forms of the, of the illness. And let me uh, start to jump towards the conclusions. So there is this never-ending question whether schools contribute to the uh, diffusion of the virus uh, from inside, so uh, whether it is uh, the gathering of people inside classrooms that contribute to contagion, or whether schools contribute from the outside, let's say, uh, through uh, increased conge congestion on uh, public transport, increased traffic, um, and uh, it's, I would say, quite difficult to disentangle the two uh, possible uh, mechanisms, uh, but we can use, let's say, uh, data from the Ministry of uh, Education on uh, uh, the number of cases registered in schools that are gathered from surveys which uh, are uh, filled by uh, the head uh, of, uh, of, uh, of schools uh, in order to uh, try to understand whether the incidence of COVID was higher inside schools, so for teachers, for students, and for the non-teaching staff, relative to the general population. And this uh, last graph uh, shows precisely this. So here, what, uh, what we plot uh, is the uh, incidence uh, ratios, so the incidence for different subgroups relative to that of the general population in different Italian regions and in different periods of time. So here on the x-axis you have different time periods from uh, something that should be September to uh, the beginning of November. Each uh, circle in the graph is um, a region and uh, the, the line that connects the different uh, dots, so the red line that connects different dots, is the um, incidence ratio for Italy as a whole. Uh, on the top panel we see students, and on the bottom panel we see teachers and the non-teaching staff, and basically the bottom line from this graph is that we see a big uh, increase in the incidence of teachers and non-teaching staff relative to the general population. We don't see uh, let's say, uh, a big increase in terms of incidence ratios for students, but this could be due to the fact that I'm comparing students to the general population, so a population that is much less likely to develop COVID to a population that is much more likely to develop COVID because uh, there are also older people in the, in the control group, let's say. But overall, it, it is a bit worrisome, let's say, the, uh, the, the picture coming from teachers and non-teaching staff, because we see that actually for them, there is uh, a, a higher relative incidence within schools uh, relative to that uh, for the general population. 
And uh, uh, so I conclude here saying that everything that uh, I showed you is a partial equilibrium analysis because it considers only the benefits of school closures. And now I pass the, uh, the, the, the microphone to uh, Maria and to Paolo that will show also the costs of school closures. Okay, uh, thank you to everyone for being here and uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, giving uh, me the opportunity to work on a, such an important topic. So what uh, I, um, I'm going to do is to present the results that uh, in uh, the second chapter of uh, this uh, report we have found on mother labor market outcomes during the pandemic. And uh, what we also do is to, uh, to try to uh, investigate how workers responded to the uh, policies that were implemented by the Italian government. So just a few words on the motivation, much has been already said. Uh, the pandemic has produced differentiated effects, and this uh, was, done, was uh, due uh, both uh, to the shutdown of uh, non-essential sectors, and then those uh, workers that were employed in these sectors experienced uh, very large losses and also to the closure of schools that uh, likely have produced a different impact on uh, mothers and fathers. And uh, so what we try to understand is uh, the short-run effects of uh, these uh, uh, closures. And uh, even if we know that uh, effects may also be long-lasting and uh, the fact that uh, women have lost uh, their jobs and that uh, they had to spend uh, uh, much time uh, uh, devoting uh, attention to their children and uh, devoting uh, time uh, to family duties may uh, set back a year of convergence in gender equality. It could also be, on the other hand, that uh, the policies that have been implemented may produce a cultural change and uh, try, maybe uh, these policies can uh, induce a more equal division of uh, childcare duties. I will uh, uh, discuss this later on. So, uh, what uh, I will do, I will first uh, show you our results on penalties suffered by different groups of workers and then uh, uh, explain some of our findings on the take-up of uh, family policies that uh, were implemented after lockdown and school closure and uh, I will focus especially on uh, the leave-taking probability of, uh, of fathers. And uh, to do this, uh, to do our investigation, we used a very rich data set. This is uh, data from the National Institute of Social Security, which provide monthly administrative data on the universe of private sector workers. So we have a lot of information, information on labor contracts, on workers in terms of gender, age, place of birth, place of residence, and also we have information on firms. So what we do is to match this data with the data on childbirth episodes. This allows us to distinguish between mothers uh, and women with uh, no children and fathers and men with, uh, uh, with no children. And uh, we also merge this information with the application on parental leave and on childcare vouchers. So we have a very large data set and very, very rich information. And uh, so I start with showing you uh, our results on uh, labor market penalties. And uh, what we do in order to estimate these penalties is to 
uh, adopt a difference in differences uh, approach and what we do is to compare the monthly outcomes in 2020 relative to 2019 and uh, we do this for mothers and fathers. And we consider different outcomes. We consider the log of monthly earnings, the log of days worked, and the quit probability, and the probability of being on a short uh, time work scheme. And we use a lot of control, uh, experience, age, and so on. So uh, what we, you see in, uh, in these graphs is uh, the uh, results we found and uh, what we do in those figures is to plot the penalties for mothers and fathers in uh, the outcome variables that uh, we have considered. And what you can see is that uh, there has been a drop, a particularly relevant drop, especially in total earnings. And this drop in earnings is uh, larger for mothers than for fathers, and this is especially true in, at the beginning of the pandemic. And uh, this reduction in earnings seemed to be due mainly to a reduction in the days worked. We don't see uh, much uh, differences, many differences uh, in terms of uh, short uh, uh, short time work the probability of being on such a scheme is uh, similar for fathers and mothers but we didn't uh, have the possibility uh, to look at the intensive margin so it could be that uh, mothers have spent more time on a short time working uh, scheme and uh, we also find that there is a difference uh, in terms of uh, quit rates we also have tried to investigate uh, whether there were differences uh, between mothers uh, and uh, uh, women without children. We do not find a uh, very significant difference, so I'm not going uh, to show uh, those results. And uh, in this uh, slide, what uh, you see is uh, uh, the difference suffered by mothers and fathers in terms of uh, total earnings for uh, different age groups of uh, their children. We consider the age of the youngest children in the, of the youngest child in the family. And what you can see there is that there is a gradient for uh, mothers uh, according to the age of the child and this gradient in the penalty is less clear for fathers. You can see something during uh, April, but then the picture became much less clear for parents. On the other hand, we see that mothers with young children have suffered a higher penalty in terms of earnings. So what we did after having examined uh, penalties suffered by mothers and fathers and uh, uh, women with and without uh, children. We tried to understand how Italian families responded to the policies that were made available by the government in order to help Italian families to cope with the increased uh, family responsibilities and duties uh, during the pandemic. Uh, the two policies that we analyze are a special COVID leave that uh, was uh, uh, available for par parents that were uh, employed, so uh, dual learner uh, families, and uh, with an allowance of 50% and a babysitting bonus. And what we do is try to understand the characteristics of families that have uh, used these, uh, uh, these uh, policies and, uh, and families who did not use them. And uh, what we found is uh, that uh, the age of uh, the child is very important in explaining whether a family has uh, obtained any form of support or not. 
And uh, in fact, we, you can see that the probability of no support is increasing with the age of the child. This was expected. And also uh, the probability of using the special COVID leave also is uh, higher for uh, younger uh, children. And uh, there are a number of other results uh, that, uh, uh, that we find. And uh, firm sites seems, uh, seems to play a very important role. And uh, also uh, what I found was, uh, what we found is that uh, these policies were used effectively to cope with uh, uh, an increase in the duties. They were not used as substitutes for already existing policies. In fact, I don't know if, uh, no, uh, uh, it doesn't work. Uh, I don't know how to use the link to the, <laughs> to the, to the slides that is, uh, that is uh, at the bottom of, uh, of, the, of the slide. But it doesn't matter. I was uh, saying to you that what uh, we see is that uh, those families that in 2020 have used the ordinary leave, because in Italy uh, there was an ordinary leave that parents could use, they also have a higher probability to use the special COVID leave. So we are not substitutes uh, these policies, but instead uh, the special COVID leave and the babysitting bonus were, were useful to uh, help families with the intensification of uh, family duties. And then what we did is to try to investigate uh, the leaving, uh, <laughs> the, the probability that fathers use uh, the special COVID leave. And the reason for doing this is that even if uh, uh, many uh, interventions have tried to uh, increase the uh, taking uh, leave probability by fathers, actually the behavior of Italian fathers have cha has changed very slowly um, over time. In fact, the probability that uh, the father has uh, applied for the leave was about 7% in 2005. It has increased a lot because in uh, 2019, 2020, this probability was 20%, uh, and similar is also the take up by fathers of the COVID special leave, but this increase, as I was saying before, was very slow. So what we did is try to analyze which factors affect the probability that the father uh, takes the, the leave, and uh, we find again that uh, the age of the children is uh, very important and fathers tend to not uh, take uh, the leave uh, if their child is, is, is very young and uh, the, the, the effect is quite uh, uh, important. And we also saw that the decision within the couple uh, is affected by economic reasons. The income of the father and the income of the mother play a role, but the magnitude of the effect is small, very small. In fact, in order to have an increase in the probability that the father takes uh, the, the leave, uh, we need to observe a re relevant increase in the uh, yearly income of the mother. An increase of uh, 2,000 euros uh, in the early income of the mother only produces an increase of five percentage points in the probability of uh, leave taking by the father. And finally, what we did is to try to understand whether the probability that the father uh, takes the leave is affected by the relative income capacity of the mother. That is the ratio between the mother and the father income. So the relative power. And what we see is that uh, the probability increases with this ratio, but uh, this trend is observed as long as the mother gains exactly the same income of the, parent, of the, the partner. 
and then we see a declining uh, trend. So it would be nice and uh, we, we are going to work more on, on these uh, results. We also find that, uh, that uh, fathers are more likely to uh, take the leave if uh, the child is a male. And uh, so there are a number of, of uh, inter in suggesting uh, suggestive results that uh, we want to analyze better. And uh, finally, what we did is just uh, to try to have uh, some uh, evidence, even if uh, it's not uh, uh, any uh, causal impact to what we want to show, but simply if there is a relationship between uh, the uh, penalties suffered by mothers and uh, uh, the behavior uh, we observed in terms of take-up probability of those policies that I was presenting to you. And what we find is that uh, those mothers uh, that uh, benefited of uh, the bonus and those mothers with the partners that took the leave, the parental leave, suffer a, a lower penalty. And uh, so I, I'm sorry, maybe I, I'm out of time. No, I'm more or less fine. And so, uh, which are the conclusions? Uh, we found that uh, there are large penalties. I didn't comment the magnitude of uh, the effects because uh, uh, I uh, had not enough time, but uh, it was clear from the graph that uh, there are uh, uh, women suffered very large penalties during the pandemic, and uh, there, are, there has been a number of policies that uh, uh, have produced uh, uh, have, uh, different behaviors, and what is interesting, and this is the last thing I want to say, is that uh, this uh, leave, the COVID leave, the special COVID leave, uh, as was additional, it is true that the take-up rate by parents, uh, by fathers was only 20%, similar to what happened uh, the year before and for the ordinary leave, but this adds to the already 20% of fathers that were using the other ordinary leave. So this was an important shock in terms of magnitude. And so it could be that this is going to change something because a lot of parents that uh, before were not using uh, this uh, type of measure uh, were induced to, to do it. So thank you very much. So I'm going to move to the third part of the report, the very last one, uh, which is about the cost suffered by the kids that were directly affected, in addition to uh, their families, of course, by the school closures. So uh, this part, if you want, is more recent uh, in terms of uh, when we produce the results uh, compared to the other two parts. Because we got the results in the last month or in the last few weeks, and, and we are still working on, on some parts. Uh, but yeah, for this I was first of all to uh, thank uh, Roberto Ricci and Patricia Falsetti from the Invalsi that are here and that did an amazing job in uh, providing in a record time uh, the data uh, that we use for the evaluation of, of the effects of school closures on. Uh, the educational achievements of kids. So Ludger was mentioning at the beginning which are the type of data that we would need, how it, hard it is to, to find this data in, in many countries. And I think in Italy there's actually uh, a great uh, data set for this purpose, the, the invalsi data, and hopefully they, they're going to be used uh, more and more for this type of evaluation. So I already mentioned the first outcome of interest that uh, we are going to look when we try to understand the costs suffered by, by kids from school closures, which is the standardized test scores that are administered every year, except uh, for the first year of the pandemic, by Invasi, and that have several advantages, like being comparable across students and schools, uh, 
uh, they are administered both in Italian, math, also in English language, but we're going to focus on Italian and math in different school grades, so uh, second, fifth, eighth, and thirteenth. So they have lots of advantages. I mean, like any other measure, I mean, no measure is perfect, so we're going to complement this also with data on dropouts that we just obtained really literally in the last few days from the Ministry of Education. So this last part is even more tentative, but we think anyway it's important to try to quantify also the cost on the extensive margin if you want in terms of kids that not just do worse in school, but they drop out at all uh, because of the pandemic. So one main caveat uh, when looking at this second type of data is that so far we were able to get only data about dropouts occurring during the school year, not in the transition between one year and the other one, one grade and the other one, which are going to be probably even more important to, uh, to quantify the cost. But okay, uh, these measures of outcomes were complemented with uh, additional data on the uh, days in which schools were in online teaching, the famous uh, DAD, uh, which is the acronym for Didattica Distanza, and these data were assembled from different sources by basically by Francesco Armile that is there, and also with the help of uh, uh, Federica and Chiara, that are the, the new research assistant of the Fondazione this year. And so they compiled a list of the days in which each, each school grade was closed in different regions, uh, and then we can aggregate this in, into this very simple graph. And what you see is that, first of all, uh, kids in high school, as we know, they were in online teaching for much longer. Uh, so there was kind of an attempt to keep uh, open at least the primary school and the middle schools, uh, while instead for the high school, which is the blue bar there, uh, I mean, the, the, the fraction of days in online learning and remote learning was much higher. And the other thing you notice that some regions in the south, like Campania, we already mentioned Campania many times, uh, they were closed for uh, longer periods of time compared to uh, most of the other regions. And this is the source of uh, variation that we're going to explore uh, in, in, in when trying to understand the effects of school closure. So, um, this is just a very preliminary picture about national trends in university scores. So, uh, since uh, during the last few years, the, the university scores they have become comparable uh, not only uh, across students or across schools within the same year, but also over time. So, what you see from this picture, it, it seems at first a kind of a mixed result because for some grades. Uh, uh, there is also an improvement, grade two, grade five. Uh, instead, for middle school and high school, there is a, a decrease in the educational attainment uh, of kids according to this measure. Now, it's interesting to remember what I show you from this uh, previous graph. So, high school and middle schools, they were closed for longer compared to primary schools, right? So, if you, I mean, this, this is a very simple scatter plot if you want, but both in Italian and in math, if you plot the change in the inversity score uh, between the, the last year before the pandemic and the first test after the pandemic against the average fraction of days uh, that kids were in, in uh, remote learning, you see that there's a clear negative relationship, right? So the, the, those in high school and middle schools that were closed for longer or that were for longer days in, in, in remote learning, they, they actually uh, decrease their performance more. Now, of course, there may be many things that occur between one year and, and the other one in addition to the pandemic. So you can refine a bit this comparison by exploiting this variation across Italian regions. And what you see basically is that there's a negative relationship again. So the longer you stay closed and the worse is the, is the change in performance uh, before and after the pandemic with the usual example of Campania, which remains closed for longer periods of time and, and display the, the largest drop in, in, uh, in performance. Um, of course, uh, schools and, and students uh, in these different regions, they may differ along many dimensions. So you can try to be a bit more sophisticated than that. So we, here we use a, a multivariate regression analysis in which we are able to try to keep constant uh, region and, and year fixed characteristics. So let's say the, the, the time shock and also 
regional differences. Uh, we also control for measures of the intensity of the pandemics. Of course, some regions, maybe they were closed for longer periods of time because the pandemics was worse and this could also affect directly the results of these kids. And so we control for the number of cases, the number of hospitalizations, the number of deaths and all these measures. Uh, uh, we can also control for student characteristics, so uh, socioeconomic backgrounds, uh, previous performance, and, and things like that. Okay, so uh, for the big funds of econometrics, this is the estimation, uh, the estimating equation. For all the others, uh, these plots they just show you, basically to summarize that uh, in all school grades, for all school grades, uh, uh, we observe uh, a decline in performance. Uh, uh, in regions that were closed for, for longer periods of time or that were for longer periods of time in, in remote learnings, okay? Uh, so the, the line is the measure of our uncertainty, so the confidence interval, so some of these estimates are more precise, some of them are less precise. We can use different measures of, uh, uh, of school closures, like we want, in this second series of graphs, we just distinguish between regions that were closed for longer periods of time, so more than one first of the days were in, in distance learning, and other regions. And the results, they change a bit. I mean, they, they are not very stable sometimes, and we are still working on this, but uh, you see clearly that all these estimates are always negative, okay? So it may be a matter of magnitude. We may want to pin down more precisely the magnitude. We may want to, we may want to get more precise estimates in the next weeks, but uh, it seems pretty clear from, from this preliminary work uh, that uh, the effects are negative. Now, since I'm running out of time, let me just mention a couple of issues. Uh, so, so uh, there may be several sources of attenuation bias in the sense we, we may be uh, underestimating the drops in performance. So one reason is that your performance in Italian and math is just part of the problem. There are other soft measures, let's say how motivated you are in going to schools, so how much you like or dislike studying and things like that, that were also affected and then can have very uh, severe longer term consequence. So there are additional uh, information in the invasive questionnaires, like for instance, if you have a space uh, uh, for study, a room for studying, so we uh, hopefully we will be able to, to exploit some of this information in the future. And the other problem I mentioned before is the extensive margin, okay? So imagine that those students that were most severely affected, they just dropped out from school. Uh, well, in this case, we would be missing exactly those students in our estimate that suffered the greatest cost, okay? So even in this respect, we may be underestimating the effects. Uh, I really don't want to uh, go too much uh, over time, so uh, let me just say we, in, in, in the next weeks or in the next month, we plan to try to get some measure of school closures at the school level or even at the class level. If possible, we try to do something like that with the measure from the Social Security Institute. So basically, whether parents of some schools, they ask for a permit for COVID-related reasons, okay? So which means that uh, probably some of the kids were also affected, but this measure was actually very noisy and, and to the was not really, uh, I mean, we couldn't really exploit this in detail uh, in this preliminary work. And also we tried to see what happens with dropouts. Uh, so dropouts, as you can see in this graph, they, they are a phenomenon that basically hits those students at the bottom of the ability distribution, as, as you can imagine. Uh, so those that are already more in trouble, so let's say in, in math or in Italian, so that's why they, they may be important. Uh, so, however, when we try to relate the, the, num the incidence of dropouts with the intensity of remote learning, we see a negative effect, okay? So it means, I mean, at face value, this would mean the, the more you stay in remote learning, uh, the lower the dropout rate is, right? So there are, it's a bit contrary to what we were expecting. One explanation is that maybe remote learning makes all evaluation a bit more lenient, right? So you, you don't really need to force yourself to go to school every day to take in class tests. It can be that you just log in or pretend to log in for, for most of the time and, and you remain 
enrolled. Uh, but of course, there's also the issue that we are not really observing, as I mentioned before, the dropout in the transition from one grade to the other. So imagine that, okay, over the year, the students, they remain enrolled, but then when it comes to enrolling to the following year, they, they just drop out, they are demotivated. I mean, we may be missing, we are missing actually uh, these transitions, right? At the moment, we don't have this data and, and this is a main limitation. Also, it's possible that some of these costs, they may unravel in the next few years, okay? So again, maybe they remain enrolled because it's even uh, less costly to stay enrolled if you, if you are struggling in school, but then later on you will find yourself in trouble when it's the moment to transition to university or, or, or to a job, okay? Uh, so, uh, final remarks, since I'm already uh, quite uh, over time, I just leave this for you, and anyway, bringing together all the three paths, uh, school closures were one way, or maybe the main way in which uh, uh, the Italian government, but also the government tried to, uh, you know, stop the pandemics or, or to slow down the pandemics, the evolution of the pandemics at the beginning, but for sure they had cost, both in terms of the kids that were themselves affected and also their families in, in terms of especially female labor market participation. Thanks a lot. So thank you very much for all the different inputs you gave us. And uh, let's now move directly to the discussions. Uh, I invite here um, Giulia Bovini from the Bank of Italy. Uh, Fabrizio Di Libotti is not physically here today, but he will connect uh, after uh, Giulia Bovini online. So, may I take the... Okay. <laughs> so, uh, thank you to Tito and the organizer for uh, giving me the opportunity to read these three papers. And I have to say they are all excellent and I think they are a must read for everybody who really wants to understand what were the consequences of the crisis for Italy. Uh, so I will try just to give a brief discussion uh, of these three papers, starting from the one that uh, Salvatore presented, so in that paper, Salvatore made a very uh, clever use of these two quasi-natural experiments that were provided by this uh, staggered reopening of school in September and later by this, let's say, unexpected closure in Campania to really find whether uh, school um, fostered the contagion or not. And um, if we look at the first exercise, the one that really used the school opening in September, we see that uh, there is this um, statistically significant increase in total cases in the test positivity rate and in hospitalization, but not in the most severe, severe outcome that will be uh, patient in, in admitted into the ICU and deaths. So concerning to this, uh, as Salvatore already stressed, I think that to really weigh the benefit of school closure, closure with respect to the cost that were discussed later, it's really important to understand whether this nil effect on deaths and really heal patient is due to the fact that the virus mostly spread among young people who are likely less prone to become critically ill or whether the horizon of the analysis was simply too short because it takes some time for an infection to become severe or even deadly. Um, and so I think that it's true that the analysis after the, the, the beginning of November become more messy because there are these, the, the national mandate that created this kind of yellow, orange, and uh, red zone, but maybe uh, there is room to move, the, to extend the analysis past this date, given the, the importance of this question, because there were regions who open at different time in September and later were uh, subject to the same regulation. And one such example will be the comparison between Piedmont and Calabria, uh, because one reason opened uh, earlier than the other and later they become a red zone at the same time. So I think it might be worth to try to uh, extend the, the horizon of this analysis to get uh, a tentative answer to, to this question of why we didn't see this increase in ICU uh, cases or that. And a figure that I found quite interesting is the one that showed the relative incidence of infection in the teaching staff compared to the general population. 
And I found it interesting that there seems to be quite some regional variation in these incidents. And I was wondering whether uh, it's possible to understand to which part this, this, the characteristic of school infrastructure across Italy matter. Um, because we know that we can control for the epidemiological situation, we can control for when the school open, and actually in the, in the open data of the Ministry of Education, there are a lot of information on each school building, such as the age or the square footage, but also the eating technology. And I thought that maybe uh, it would be nice to use, to look at this information, aggregate them at the regional level and really see if the status of in schooling infrastructure is the same across the country or not. And if this can help explain uh, why maybe in some regions school were more uh, a cluster of contagion than in others, and in particular because since Salvatore already told us that the results for Italy are in line with those of the US but are not in line with those of Germany, I think it's really interesting to understand why uh, is that the case and whether school infrastructure play a role in that. Now moving to the second paper, um, Maria stressed it already, but I really think it's important to look at this crisis through the lens of gender because of this uh, intertwining between uh, what happened in the labor market and what happened in school. So on the, on the one hand, in the labor market, we know that the service sector and precarious employment were particularly it, and those are the sector where, in which we find a lot of women. And at the same time, we had this unprecedented school closure that really uh, increased the the responsibility for childcare that we know typically fall on women. Um, so uh, I really think this paper is super interesting because it tried to understand how this demand and supply factor really interacted to uh, affect female employment throughout the crisis. So these are um, two pictures uh, taken from uh, Maria presentation. So I found super interesting this comparison this is the short-term earning penalty, and we see a stark difference between mother and fathers. And on the right graph, there is no, not such a big difference between mother and non-mother. So when I saw this graph by reading the paper, my question is, so why is this the case? Because this is very interesting. So in the paper, you mentioned that actually there might be some measurement error in how mother are defined, so some mother could end up in the non-mother group, which will cause an attribution bias. Or another explanation could be that this is more a female-male gap rather than a mother-father gap, and so that labor demand is really the factor driving uh, the gap. So I think that maybe with this amazing data that you have, I will find interesting if you could try to decompose a bit this kind of gap in the earning penalty to the part that is driven by the different sector wo women are in and the different type of contract they usually have versus more uh, the role of the household composition, so whether women and men have children or not and how much they made use of this parental leave who will depress earning and the number of uh, days work. Um, and Along this point, I will find it interesting maybe to run these exercises separately for uh, essential sector and an essential one, because in for people working in essential sector, this kind of demand factor were more muted and maybe the household composition would, uh, would come out as, uh, as stronger. Um, and then there is this super interesting part about family policies where they really uh, show us first um, which type of, uh, uh, of um, policy the family choose, nothing, the, the leave or the babysitter bonus, and secondly, who takes it, whether it's the mother or the father. And a result that I really find super interesting also for the design of this type of policy is what you find about the role that uh, the size of the firm seems to have, uh, both for the take up and for who decide to take the leave. So I really think I will be very happy to see maybe some more analysis on this to really understand uh, why the size of the firm matter. It, might, it may be for a number of reasons. It may also be a kind of the type of worker who select into this type of firm, but I really think it's something that is very interesting to, to further analyze. And finally, uh, when you basically study the take-up, um, I think there are some other covariates that it may be nice to have in your regression. And one, for example, will be belief about gender roles. 
Now, of course, this data is not available at an individual level in IMSS, but there is an ISTAT survey from 10 years ago that allows to build this measure at the sectoral geographical level, so it might be nice to have it uh, in your regression. And also, I was wondering about, in the choice between the leave and the, and the bonus, what was the, the role of the epidemiological situation, so maybe it could be, it would be nice to see if in those areas that were mostly hit by the virus, the, the choice of uh, uh, having a babysitter is maybe lower because parents feared to have some stranger in the house. Uh, and finally, moving to the third paper, which is about educational achievement. Um, so basically, uh, as, uh, as Paolo said before, this paper was trying to really measure the impact of remote teaching on achievement by exploiting these variation in, in the length of school closure across region and across grade. And the first evidence are really, uh, are really showing a negative effect, although there might be some uh, precision issue sometimes. Uh, I really think this is uh, a crucial topic to understand what's happened to children's achievement, but to overall well-being. And I completely agree that we need both more data and more analysis. So I'm sure you will do <laughs> all of this. It was just a matter that you really have a short time, but just some comment. Um, I think a very nice future of Invalsi data is that we can move from score to skill because for older students, alongside score, Invalsi provides also a measure of the skill, the score um, translates to, which maybe is a, more, um, is, is a measure that is easier to attach a meaning to. And so maybe you could also study as an outcome the fraction of students who don't reach, uh, let's say, the minimum skill level for their age, and also study this, this topic that I think is crucial, which is the implicit dispersion. So those students who sit the test, maybe even graduate from school, but don't reach the minimum skill level in any subject. Uh, second, as was already mentioned this morning, I think it will be key to move beyond average and really look at heterogeneity of this effect in the population. Uh, University provided the socioeconomic status, which is a very important variable. And since now university can be uh, uh, matched longitudinally, I think that beyond that looking at the current socioeconomic status, it could be interesting to look at the change between the status in the past and the current one, because maybe we could find some, some families that really had a shock. Because as also Marta mentioned in their discussion, children were uh, not only experiencing the closure in the school, but in some families, economic condition also changed dramatically during the pandemic. So I think also tracking the variation of this socioeconomic status over time uh, might be interesting to find the children that were mostly uh, hit uh, by the shock. And also I think the migration angle might be interesting because for migrant children, school was an essential tool for integration, right? For learning the language and interacting with native students. And so I think this is also a population that will be uh, worth uh, looking at in more detail. And another population that I think is super interesting are those that the literature would call academically resilient students, right? So these are students that thrive academically, even if they come from a disadvantaged background. So I really would like to see what happened to them. So were this kind of student uh, able to maintain their academic standing even if the school were closed? What happened in general to the prevalence of this student has become harder for students without a good background to achieve a good result if they cannot uh, attend the school? And uh, the last two points, I think, uh, with this data, uh, maybe to move on a more bright side, there will probably be sex stories, right? We will probably see that there are schools whose students perform well, maybe also holding cost compared to school with students with the same characteristics, so in, in a kind of a more value-added model, that I think it's crucial to understand which are the school and really try to understand why they work, what did the teacher do, and maybe, I, I don't know if it's feasible, but really go there and interview them, because I'm sure there will be also some, some resilience story and it will be good to understand why. Uh, and finally, uh, I think this topic of uh, when we look at invalsi data, we always need to remember that this is the intensive margin of skill because we don't know anything about people who don't sit the test, either because they are absent that day or because they have dropped out. So 
I think understanding better who they are was always important, but this year has become crucial. Uh, and I, I'm sure it will happen, but I really hope it will be possible to merge this invalsi data with the uh, micro data that the Ministry of Education has about the career of every student to really uh, understand better who the students are and what we can do to bring them back to school, hopefully. And I, I finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Giulia Bovini. Let's now move to the second discussion by Fabrizio Gili uh, Zilibotti from Yale University. Let me check if he's online. Uh, I am online, and uh, I think you should see the slides. Can you confirm that? Yes, we do. Thank you. Thank you so much. The floor is yours. You have about 10 minutes. We are, we are a bit late. <laughs> Yes. So thank you for having me uh, in this important discussion. Um, and, you know, uh, the, this is a discussion on the costs and the benefit of school closures in Italy. And the report, as it has been uh, explained, uh, looks at three dimensions. The first, the effect of school closures on the containment of COVID-19. Uh, the second, here I revert the order because I will discuss the, the, the three contributions in this order. Then uh, students' educational achievement and gender inequality. So let me say up front, uh, I think this is a terrific uh, report, uh, very interesting data, solid methods, informative findings. I hope that uh, uh, the politics will uh, uh, and the government will take very seriously what's there, because I think it's a very important input to, to, to an informed discussion. So in my discussion, I will make some brief remarks on findings. Uh, Julia did a terrific job before me in, uh, in analyzing uh, the, the, the more specific aspects and, and I will try to give also some complementary uh, perspective. So let me start with uh, the, uh, the first uh, uh, part, the one Salvatore uh, Latanfio discussed. So the uh, impact of uh, school reopening on the containment of, uh, of COVID. Uh, here, as he mentioned, uh, the results are a bit all over the place. So if you look at different countries, different studies, in some cases it looks as closing school as, uh, or reopening schools have a very significant effect on, on infection. Others suggest uh, the, the opposite. And I think that uh, in part, this, is, uh, this has no solution. There is no study that can use a, a perfect experiment. So there, uh, no country would be willing uh, or has been willing to do that uh, uh, perfect experiment in which uh, randomly some uh, uh, schools are closed and some are open. So the context uh, is very important and the context may be very different. So, uh, you know, in some places uh, uh, there is a lot of increase in the local traffic, in other places that is almost nil. Uh, in some, you know, in the United States, there is a big debate now about whether children should wear or not wear masks, uh, you know, outside. Uh, here on the, on the highway, there is a big a banner saying unmask our children as someone uh, has paid. So all these contextual elements are very diff difficult to isolate. Uh, so even if I think that the, uh, the study does a, a great job, uh, it's, uh, you know, somehow very difficult, even this, uh, that this uh, staggered, uh, 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 the study of the staggered closure, staggered reopening uh, uh, of, uh, of schools, uh, is in, in, in the end the last war. And you see it already from uh, the map of uh, uh, Italy that Salvatore already uh, laid out. Uh, there is a, a huge uh, uh, geographic correlation. So it's, it's almost like uh, comparing uh, the south uh, with uh, the north, with some interesting exception, Molise, uh, and then uh, the Campania uh, uh, study, which I think is very useful, actually, uh, to, because it's a, it's a little less subject to this, uh, to this criticism. So, you know, it's a little bit like having two points uh, to do the estimate. Almost, you know, there is a lot of correlation. So you cannot treat every region as an independent observation. And I think that it's, uh, uh, you know, it's still very useful to do it. Uh, more, more important, when uh, school closes and when school reopens, is often associated with a general statement to the to the uh, evolution of the of the uh, pandemic. Uh, so this is, of course, an, an important caveat. Uh, I like this uh, Campania study, partly because uh, one could argue there is a kind of uh, Vincenzo De Luca discretionary intervention there, um, which is possibly uh, true. Uh, even when I look at this figure, 
uh, you see the, the, the model uses linear, the, the study uses linear methods. So it uses a difference in difference approach. And I wonder, uh, based on pre-trend, so I wonder if one could complement that with uh, uh, feeding uh, a SEER model for uh, different regions, like estimating the SEER model and then seeing if there is uh, some type of uh, switch in the parameters uh, for the uh, uh, cases in, in that are analyzed for the treated case, for instance, Campania here. Something else that I think would be useful would be to see the picture, this picture for, for all regions so that we would see if to what extent Campania is really an outlier. At any rate, I find this, this very interesting. So the, the second part uh, of the, my discussion uh, is going to deal with uh, uh, the effect of, uh, of school closure on, on education. Now here, uh, uh, as, uh, as uh, Paolo said, uh, the, 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 what he showed was, was uh, uh, is very, uh, it came to me yesterday afternoon, so I cannot really get into an analytical discussion of, uh, of uh, what they do. I think it looks, of course, very interesting and the preliminary result looks uh, uh, somehow what one expects. So there is perhaps a bit more noise. Dropout might be uh, an important dimension that uh, they still don't have uh, the appropriate data. So I want to talk about a dimension that has been uh, analyzed a bit less and that I would like to push uh, the authors to uh, analyze the data also in, in, this, uh, in this respect. So to, to do more to the extent to which uh, uh, school closure can actually increase the problem of uh, inequality, growing inequality that we observe around the globe. Uh, you know, in a recent study with uh, um, uh, Agostinelli, Dopke and Sorrenti, we, 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 we take this perspective of seeing how much the future society will be uh, affected by the closing down of what Horace Mann uh, uh, used to call, uh, the, has called the, the great equalizer of society. So uh, essentially, let me say for a moment, let me, uh, what we do, probably because they, they can do something in, uh, similar with, uh, with, uh, with their data. Uh, so this is, a, this is trying to predict uh, uh, medium and long-term effects on inequality of something for which we have very little historical precedent. So it's not that we can just make inference based on, on past events. So what we use is a model that uh, uh, has been estimated with pre-COVID pre data in the United States. It's a dynamic model of skill formation where there are peer effects, parental investments, and the choice of uh, parenting style are, are endogenous. So, so these are the, the, the key dimensions. There is a school, there is a, a process of uh, accumulation of, uh, of uh, human capital, and then importantly, there are peer effects. So the interaction of children with other children is very important to capture the, the, uh, the point of Horace Mann about the great equalizer. And then we make plausible assumption about the changes in the environment school uh, in, uh, that, that uh, school closure implies, and we run counterfactual simulation. And then invalid data could be very useful to this. So let me say how we do it and what we find for the United States. It would be interesting to see what happens in Italy. So we assume that the, uh, COVID is the following set of things in the model. For the children, there is a fall in productivity of the skill formation technology because there is no in-class activity. There is a loss of in-person contact with some friends that we have estimated have some uh, effect on the learning of the children, and there are changes in the peer environment. This is very important. Even in the United States, where there is a lot of segregation across schools, there is much less segregation at the school level than at the block level, so at the residential level. And I, I believe this is true everywhere, almost by, by definition. In the school, you have mixing of children that come from different places. So if for one year you stop that interaction, you are going to have some consequences. And the people uh, uh, interaction become more local. And, and from the literature on peer effect, we know that that can be important. On the side of parents, there are new demands uh, on their time that are imposed by the need of replacing the teachers. And some, of course, have better knowledge to do that. There are a uh, different extent of, uh, of flexibility, telecommuting, and uh, you know, parents also respond to changes to the peer environment. So just to give you an idea of one of the input we use, each of these is disciplined by data, but you know, what we observe is that the time parents spend with children goes up uh, significantly during COVID. This is of course uh, obvious, children are at home, but 
Even more important, the time, the, the, the socioeconomic gradient increases dramatically in the United States. These are data for, for the US on time use service. So we see that already before COVID, a wealthier parent, better educated parents spend more time with their children. During COVID, this becomes much, uh, much sharper. The gradient is, is much higher. So to come quicker to the main result, because I don't have time, of course, to present everything, uh, what we find is that one year of shutdown of schools implies very diverse effects. And for the children of family that come uh, from the 20% uh, uh, poorest family, it implies a loss of uh, skills uh, of human capital as measured by GPA or by other uh, indicators of the order of 50%. So this is, this is, again, based on our model and on the input I, I have told you. So you see that for the most uh, 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 well-off uh, families, uh, there is uh, no such effect. And that's uh, you know, very important to think about, uh, about the future and something, again, that should be investigated in the Italian case. So this is a very important uh, difference in, in terms of US uh, grading. It would mean that for the poorest children, the straight B becomes uh, C in half of the subject, which is a, a, large, a large effect. We can also uh, make some forecasts about how this will be reabsorbed when school reopens. So if you have one year of disruption and then you reopen, well, during the cycle of a high school, uh, our estimates imply that 50% of the gap will be gone, but 50% will persist. So this is going to create a long lasting uh, effect that uh, will stay. So we also discuss why, and peer effects are, are very important. So the fact that you separate children and the children don't see school for a while tend to have effects that are very persistent in part because of the response that parents uh, provide. Let me spend my last uh, two minutes to talk about the other topic, which is also, of course, very important. So gender inequality. The, the findings here are in line with the studies for other countries. Uh, in general, the evidence uh, 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 indicates a stronger effect of the COVID shock on female earnings and, and labor supply. Now, to me, an important question, it was uh, touched upon briefly by, by the presenter is, well, is it just a symptom of something we already knew, which doesn't mean that we want, uh, we don't care, we do care about that, but, but it's something that given that what we know about our society and our family's work, we should expect. Or there is more, namely, is COVID effect going to be persistent? So it's going to reverse some trend towards a, a reduction of gender inequality. Or if you want to see it you know, in a bit more uh, uh, a nerdy way, uh, do we observe a rational response of a unitary household or it's a reflection of some cultural stereotypes that can even be reinforced. And here, among the various pieces of evidence that was produced, one that was not mentioned uh, in the presentation, but it is discussed in the report, is the quit behavior. So during the recessions, uh, uh, quits fall because turnover decreased, but they document that quit falls significantly less for women. In other words, because this is what we, we care, more women than men are willing to quit uh, their job in order to stay at home and to deal with, with the shock. And we know that quit, especially if it's quit into unemployment, uh, is going to have persistence. So this is a signal that there may be something that actually uh, uh, sticks after the end of COVID. So, and on this I conclude, what type of policies I think uh, should be enacted by, by the government? I believe uh, in this area and not only that uh, policies should fight the attachment for labor market, keep people in the labor force. Italy has a big problem with that. And some of the measures that are intended to uh, help and support people during the crisis, which are necessary and useful, may actually become uh, a problem once uh, uh, you know, we want to, to foster the recovery. So I think the target fiscal incentive to bring people, especially women, back to work are important, and the same type of policies should be used uh, uh, for young people. So the, there's too many people who, are, uh, uh, who have a low attachment to the labor force, especially among the young people. I think this is the moment in which the government uh, uh, should uh, uh, think of a serious reform that uh, attack that problem. And thank you, and sorry for going slightly over time. Thank you very much, Fabrizio Zilibotti.
Uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time for uh, the general discussion, but uh, I would like to take at least one, two questions. So if a microphone is available, yes. Over there, in the middle, Roberto. And then I guess so you will have some time to reply to the comments and to the questions. Thank you very much for these very interesting studies. Um, uh, the, quest the question is for Dr. Lattanzio. Um, the results that you showed um, are quite in contrast with um, a lot of literature on, on the topic of the um, diffusion of the, uh, of the incidence of COVID cases in schools. And uh, in particular, as you know, the, the, the work by Gandini and collaborators that you cited uh, uses exactly the same uh, structure of the regional closures, uh, but uses the data from uh, the Ministry of, uh, of Instruction, and it, um, it reaches the opposite result. So it shows that there is no difference. the extent of the uh, pandemic induced by the, the school closure. So how do you explain this difference? Thank you. There is another question here. From Vincenzo Galasso, Bocconi University. Uh, thanks. I think it's a related question. Um, to the previous one, I was wondering. I mean, there is, uh, there is a, as you said, um, there's quite a lot of work trying to understand the impact that school closure has on the diffusion of the pandemic. But the, the work that I found more, um, I guess, uh, I mean, not interesting, but uh, uh, better done, perhaps, is the one by Blavot in the um, PNAS 2021, and it looks at the Swedish data where they basically have this lower, higher secondary school divide. And so they can actually look at this, uh, um, this difference in the same location. And they have data to actually look at what happens to the parents and to the teachers. And they found very little effect. So it's not a zero effect, but it's a very little effect. And I was wondering whether you can put your results, uh, like in the context of what they do. I mean, they do find something, but they end up saying that it's actually very little. And so I, th I was wondering whether in terms of magnitude, you can say something uh, on, on this. And the second question that I had is related to your control group uh, with respect to campaign. I was wondering what is the size of Puya in your synthetic control? Because Puya was another region where actually they they closed the school quite a lot. Actually, it was a bit a la carte. Emiliano let parents decide whether they want to send their kids to school or not. So if you have them, you may actually have a little bit of an issue in your estimation. Thanks. Okay, I think we go back to the authors. We don't have much time, unfortunately, for questions. So you have like two minutes each. <laughs> Good luck. I, I start to reply to, to the first question about uh, the comparison with uh, Gandini. So actually, in the last part of the paper, I use exactly the same data that they use coming from the surveys that head of schools had to fill during the, uh, the period from September to November. Uh, so I think that that paper is reassuring, but uh, in my opinion, it makes some sample selection that are quite questionable especially in that part, for example, they show only the surveys for the 7th of November, uh, which likely is uh, sort of endogenous also to school closures that were happening in the, in the second wave. Uh, and actually, if you show the full pattern of the incidence ratios from the beginning to uh, November, you actually see that there is some heterogeneity across regions and over time. Um, and also, as to the first part, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, they choose the uh, comparison between selected groups of regions, uh, which, is, uh, which is totally fine. 
um, and they justify, of course, why they choose this, uh, let's say, two by two comparisons in the evolution of cases. Uh, let's say that probably uh, the evidence in this report complements their evidence showing, let's say, averages across uh, different, uh, different regions. But of course, I mean, they are epidemiologists, I am an economist, so probably uh, I am missing something from the epidemiology point of view and also from the literature in, uh, let's say, more health and epidemiology uh, topics. Uh, as to the point by Vincenzo, so I don't know the paper on Sweden, uh, so maybe I have to check it. Uh, for Italy, there is a paper um, on Sicily uh, during the, the first wave where they basically have very detailed geolocated data and they basically show that, uh, I mean, they can go really at the level of school closure and look at whether in the neighborhood there is an increase or decrease of cases. And the results of this paper, I'm mentioning this paper because the results of this paper go in the same direction as the Swedish uh, example that you were making, uh, namely that they find a positive effect, uh, meaning an increase in cases in schools that were uh, opening early in Sicily because there was some within region variation in uh, some cities in Sicily, uh, but the magnitude of the effect was small. So also for Italy we have some evidence like that. And I will follow the suggestion to compare the magnitude of the estimates across different studies. As to the weight of Puglia in the synthetic control, honestly, I don't remember, uh, but uh, I, I'll check, uh, let's say that uh, in terms of technicalities, I do all the standard stuff that you do when you use synthetic controls, but I will surely check, let's say, how, what's the weight of Puglia in the, in the synthetic control and see if the results are dependent on that. Thank you, and thank you. Uh, Would you like to... <laughs> to go back to the comment uh, on the quit rate that uh, I think is very important uh, because, uh, as was uh, suggested before, uh, seeing uh, our different behavior in terms of quit rate uh, is probably uh, saying us that uh, these mothers are uh, leaving because, uh, and so uh, this could uh, imply that these effects could be also long lasting. And so just because uh, I, I skipped <laughs> I was afraid of having not enough time, but I think uh, it is important to stress this point. Yes, for our part, we, uh, I mean, me and Tita, I guess we just want to thank um, both discussants uh, for, uh, for, for the comment, and thank you particularly to Julia for calling it a paper. I mean, it was not a paper, we are aware of that. It was a set of messy slides and results, but yeah, this was very kind from you. And uh, yeah, we, as we said, I mean, this is pretty much work in progress. So you mentioned, I think, uh, the, the heterogeneity between uh, immigrants and non-immigrants or high and low socioeconomic status. So we tried that, and even in this respect, the results are not really as expected, which means it makes them very interesting, but before presenting them, we wanted to uh, think a bit more about them, but in essence, we find that it's, it's not really immigrants or low socioeconomic status that suffer the greatest cost in terms of at least the changes in, in the results, but it's pretty much also uh, natives and high socioeconomic status. So, it could be that maybe, uh, you know, stronger students in a sense, they uh, get more from going in, in class in prisons than, than from remote learning, and this is an explanation, but again, since, uh, again, it goes a bit contrary to our a priori, we wanted to, th to, to think a bit more about that. Yeah, but thanks again for, for all the comments. Thank, uh, thank you very much. Let's move directly to the next uh, 
uh, session. Uh, the next research will be presented by Till von Wachter from uh, University of California in uh, Los Angeles. He will, speak, uh, he will present his paper on midlife impact of graduating in a recession, and he will present online. So let me check if he is um, available. Mi sentite? Yes. Buongiorno. Mi piace molto che non possa essere lì in persona, però eh, stiamo aspettando il terzo figlio. Very sorry that I cannot be in person there. Quanti minuti ho? Unfortunately, 20, if you can make it. 20 minutes? Yes. 25. I was prepared for 40, so I'll be skipping a little bit. Um, I'm going to share my slides. We, we can yeah. compromise on uh, 25, uh, 30. Yeah, as I said, I would have loved to be in person. We have a family reunion going on in Monferrato just now, uh, so it would have been a great trip. But I'm very happy and very pleased to be able to present this work. And you're going to get uh, a, a one and a half hour presentation condensed in a very short time. So I'll, I'll try to keep you moving swiftly. So in, in every recession, oh, let's see. There is a clamor or concern, right, for workers entering the labor market just when the recessions hit, right? There's a realization that the first sort of year in the labor market is just a very formative period, right? And that's certainly been true during the uh, um, pandemic. Right? Now, we can, you know, look into the future, right? So the way to learn about how uh, labor market entrance might be affected over the long term is to go to past recessions, right? So in a way, we're, we're back to the future here. And what, here's what we already know about the long-term effects of entering the labor market in recession for labor market entrance. So we know that there are effects on, on earnings that last about 10 to 15 years, but so they're large initially, but they fade. Right? And that's effect is initially due to lower, you know, quality employers and lower economic, lower occupational status. Um, but in the fates, and that research is mostly based on the US, but I have a um, Journal of Economics Perspectives piece from last year that also takes stock of what we know from Europe, and, and by and large, the results indicate the same, right? Now, the important question is, uh, there could actually be longer term effects, and that's indicated by two set of findings. First of all, there are sort of uh, specific papers that look at some longer term outcomes, right? So for example, my co-author has a paper showing that completed fertility in the long run is actually affected by the unemployment rate when you graduate in a recession. The other thing we know is that for college graduates in the United States entering during the 82 recession, which uh, was the, the biggest recession after the Second World War, before the Great Recession in 2008, right? There are longer term effects, right? But that's a very specific group and in particular, a group that generally does better than the average labor market entrance. And so before this paper, there was just no systematic overview of how entering the labor market in a recession affects the life course. And that's interesting because if you just take standard life cycle models, right, um, you, there, there, there are clear predictions how this initial shock, right, not only affect earnings, but also uh, marriage, when individuals get children, their lifetime fertility, right, divorce, as well as potentially health outcomes. And now the difficulty is, of course, that to study these very long-term effects, you, you need to know, in principle, where people are when they were in their 20s, what happened in their labor market, and then you want to know what happened until they were age 50. And most sort of longitudinal data sets simply have two small samples. To, to estimate these, these long-term impacts on a broad range of outcomes with enough precision. And so that's where we come in. What we did right, to, to, to sort of cut the Gordian knot, we went ahead and used an approach that makes repeated cross-section data useful, right? And we used the, the, the mortality data, the current population survey, the American community survey, 
and the U.S. censuses. So these are all very large, either labor market survey or just the, 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 the universe of mortality, right, that have information that we can harness. And then using those data sets, we analyze the long-term effect of short-term fluctuations on, uh, of, of state level unemployment rates. And we can't just do that without doing something slightly different, and I'll tell you exactly what it is, right? But using these repeated cross-section data, you know, essentially constructing synthetic cohorts, right? We can analyze the effect of early labor market entry, right? Adverse labor market entries on mortality into midlife, right? And that's sort of a, a very precisely measured health outcome. And then we analyze the effect of adverse labor market entry on socioeconomic outcomes. And we don't only do earnings, we do the entire range, including you know, fertility, marriage, divorce, uh, you know, the characteristics of spouses and so on. So we, we can really bring to bear these quite large detailed data sets. And what we get is sort of a first accounting of the, how a big initial shock affects individuals over the life cycle, right? And just so, you know, I won't have time to talk about it, just to give you a, a sense, if you look at the effect of the unemployment rate in, in the first years, right, in different recessions in the United States, right, so you can take every, you can take the 82 recession, the 91 recession, the 2001 recession, and the 2008 recession, and just plot the effect on earnings, right, you get a very well behaved pattern where recessions in that respect look quite similar over time. And similarly, you know, there's a sort of a consistent relationship with the initial unemployment rate and, and, and starting wages. So you get a, a, a recession pattern that is similar across recessions. So I feel very comfortable, you know, even though we're going to look 30 years back, right, into a recession that happened in the early 80s, right, that we're going to get patterns that at least are representative of a sort of a U.S. business cycle, right? And also we do a lot of sensitivity to make sure that these initial shocks during the 82 recessions are not correlated with other big economic shocks that occur right in the U.S. later on. So with with that, all I have to say today about sort of the, the robustness of our results, we come up away with very exciting findings. First of all, uh, we we find an impact of entering the labor market onto mortality in middle age. Right? So mortality first goes down as people work less and have fewer accidents, but then it increases as people hit their mid to late thirties and certainly into the 40s um, and these effects are you know not huge right but but they're there so a, a, a large recession such as the 82 recession would have caused six to nine month loss in life expectancy if you want to think about what the covid recession could have looked like you want to just double those numbers you know for for a rule of thumb because the impact on unemployment rate was was that much larger in the short run now what's interesting is that these mortality effects are caused by health behaviors, right? So we have uh, um, uh, an increase in, in drug poisoning and in heart and liver disease, right? And then we can talk about the interpretation of that, but certainly consistent with changes in behavior due to changes in economic condition. And then we find that the entire life cycle is affected. Right? You see not only you know, long-term effects on earnings, but also on wages, right? There's family income is affected because spouses from the same court are married and they have the same shock, right? We see a, an increase in marriage in the short run and an increase in fertility in the short run, but over the long run, that is reversed. Right? And in, in, in the long run, we see a, a, a rise in work-related disability. That's our sort of main non-mortality measure of health, right? and increase in the receipt of, of disability insurance. And what's very interesting, and I don't really have time to discuss that, is that these dynamic impacts throughout the life course, right, can really be well explained by predictions from standard economic life cycle models. Right? And so the, the takeaway here is that such an adverse initial shock, right, of entering the labor market in a recession, right, leads to long-term effects through the entire life course. Um, and just to stay on that just a little longer, right? So what we get here, right? We get an improved understanding of the life cycle impact of labor market shocks. So at least labor economists tend to focus on, um, on earnings and wages, right? 
But here you see that you want to keep in mind the entire life cycle outcomes. That, that, that is not a surprise. There are many literatures that do study the effect of economic conditions on you know, non-economic outcomes, so to speak. Or, but here we have an initial shock and really can study the effect over the entire life cycle of that initial shock. And we get, of course, a better understanding of the cost of, of business cycles. Um, and what's also helpful, there's this, this, a p there's a piece here where you really learn about how these economic shocks affect short and long-term health. And finally, um, I just need to have a plug here, right? Our approach to be able to harness these large cross-sectional data sets can be really valuable. Uh, for, for, for re replicating what we do in, in other countries or for other time periods. Uh, and so I'll briefly talk about that. Now, um, I'll have to be very brief on the conceptual background and the approach and data, but I'll try to give you a flavor of the argument here. And I'm gonna spend most of my time on our results. And so, just to give you a sense, right? we, we don't have an integrated model and I'm not aware of an integrated model of life cycle outcomes where you integrate family outcomes and health and mortality with career outcomes. But so these predictions are from sort of separate models, but I'm pretty confident that, that they would hold in, in, a, in a unified model. And the point is, it's actually not easy to get long-term earnings and, and wage effects. Um, but there are a couple of models that have done that. Um, you know, I have, a, I, have a, I have a paper that builds a model of job search. And the idea here is uh, um, that if you have a, this initial shock, you'll be uh, the last in, so to speak, and there's a, a first out phenomenon. And that might, you have simply lower tenure at your firm, lower tenure in your industry and occupation. And so you may not have access to certain types of job opportunities in terms of lower wages, or you may be more likely to be laid off. So you can generate, right, with some reasonable uh, mechanisms, uh, a recovery that is initial and then a reopening of the losses later on in life. And that's um, what we see. The family, the predictions on family outcomes crucially rest on income versus substitution effects, where the notion is that in the short run, especially women, right, may find it appealing to invest into family and childbearing if the labor market is weak. And so we see, or uh, this increase in, 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 in marriage and fertility early on. Um, and that has been documented elsewhere as well. And, but in the long run, the negative income effect prevails. And so a lower lifetime income would then predict lower fertility, lower marriage rates, and higher divorce rates. And what's interesting here is that this, this, these predictions have been taken to be different for lower income and higher income individuals. And in our data, we can test that. And indeed, we find that uh, the educational status, uh, it, the, the initial education status makes a difference. And finally, we have uh, a discussion of models of mortality and, and morbidity. And that's uh, maybe something you have thought about least. But the idea, in a nutshell, is that there's a race between investment in health that could take many forms, right? It could be monetary investment or time investment right? and depreciation of health. And early in your life, everybody has a high health stock and they keep investing, right? But there's a, a accelerating health depreciation. And so if individuals have lower investment behavior when they're young, because of lower income, more stress, because they have to work harder, right? There's an accumulating health difference between the lucky cohorts and the unlucky cohorts. That doesn't matter when you're young because very few people are dying. Very few people are close to the threshold where you're likely to die. But as these cohorts are getting older, the unlucky cohort is increasingly hitting the death threshold, right? And, and, and that death threshold is, is, is coming closer. Right? And, and, and then as you, pe these people hit midlife, you would predict increasingly larger number of deaths, right? And actually a constant death, positive death probability. Uh, in terms of log points. So these are very specific uh, predictions that we can take back to our data um, from existing models. And I just wanted to give you a brief flavor here, uh, um, just to 
you know, that, that we can harness our thinking about this using the, 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 the economic theory. Now, let's briefly talk about the empirics here. And it's, it's, uh, there are certain aspects here that, that are uh, uh, tricky, and, uh, but I'll have to keep it swift. The main idea is that we're having a group level shock that in the US you could think about that as, as the unemployment rate in the state of which an individual is graduating in the graduation year. Right? And so it makes sense to just operate at the cell level. You know, we have micro data, we aggregate everything up um, to uh, an average outcome at the state year and graduation year. And then you run a cell level regression, right? Where you have, you know, graduation and, 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 and year effects, and you also have experience effects, right? And the experience effect captures the life cycle gradient, right? And then the initial shock, right? The state level unemployment rate captures the shift in the life cycle gradient. And I'll show you estimates of that shift. And the difficulty here is that, of course, individuals you know, may choose when to graduate and where to graduate. So in a way, right, which unemployment rate you're facing at graduation might be endogenous, right? And the other problem is that some of the data sets that we're working with do not actually have information of, on when individuals graduated or when they went into the, uh, where they went into the labor market, right? So what we have, right, we have vital statistics data, which is simply data from mortality records where we have state of birth. We have the American Community Survey, that's a labor force survey, where we have also state of birth, right? And then we have the current population survey, that's the most common labor force survey, where we just have state of residence, right? And in, in two of these, we have years of education. So what, what we use as a shock, right, is our unemployment rates that are published starting from 1976 onwards, right? So we rely on that sort of, that's a workhorse data set, but it makes it a little hard to go before because the data that is used to calculate these unemployment rates isn't really available beforehand, right? And so we focus on co cohorts, right? Birth cohorts that enter the labor market before, during, and after the 82 recession. Right? And we have to make this data work for us. And so here's what we could do, right? We could just impute uh, the, the time of entry into the labor market by um, looking at the number of, of, of the years of education of an individual, right? Plus six when they enter school, right? And say we call time zero, right? When they enter the labor market, when, when they're, they're uh, when the year is equal to the year of birth plus you know, six plus years of education. That's the Minserian approach that is canonical in labor economics, right? So that's a standard way to approximate labor market experience, right? But say in the current population survey, we could only use state of residence. Right? So we have a proxy for labor market entry and, and, and a proxy for labor market for, the, for the, uh, uh, the labor market of entry, but it might be faulty because people may be moving over time. And so what we instead do right, to address this issue, we look at birth cohorts and, and look at, at a birth cohort and look, where is this birth cohort migrating to? Right? And we constru construct what you can think of as the expected unemployment rate at graduation. So if you take uh, individuals born in California, the majority of them will stay in California and hence will face the unemployment rate in California when they're 20. But some of them move to the neighboring states, to Nevada, Arizona, Oregon, right? And so we construct the average unemployment rate that this cohort would have faced had they migrated at the average rate that other cohorts migrated. And we, and, and we do the same thing for the average timing of graduation. And so we call that the double weighted unemployment rate. That's just the, the expected unemployment rate for a cohort had they behaved like other cohorts. And that takes out, right, the cohort-specific choice that may be driven by the recession itself, because we don't use cohort-specific migration rates, and we don't use cohort-specific uh, um, uh, education, graduation rates. So, so then instead, right, instead of using the unemployment rate in the state of residence when they graduated, 
we use our double weighted, the expected unemployment rate as a proxy. We could have used it as an instrument. At the end of the day, we find the same thing that that entire literature has found, that endogenous graduation and endogenous mobility is not really a big deal. And that is because there's actually not that much migration to affect these results in the, in the United States, at least not in the 82 recession. So then what we do is to just benchmark this initial shock. We look at where the literature has been before, and that's sort of a canonical estimate, right? But this is an, an estimate from a paper of ours that's actually for the entire labor market, whereas most people focus on college graduates because they're easier to work with, right? But it's important because lower educated workers have larger shocks. And what we can then do, we can fast forward our short-term effects, right, to the long-term. So what you see here is that difference in log earnings for an increase of one point of the initial unemployment rate by year since graduation, right? So you can think of this as, a, as an earnings profile over their careers, right? And, and this is the shift of the earnings profile. And you see a large initial loss, a strong recovery that sort of recovers by 10 years into the labor market, and then a long-term reopening. And here I'm showing you just what I would use if I would get the current uh, uh, unemployment rate in the, in, the, in the state they were living in at age 20, right? Whereas here now I'm adding, whoop, a constructed double rated unemployment rate, right? Where I use the birth cohorts, right? To assess where people were born and to impute them the expected unemployment rate at the state uh, of, of the state in which they were graduating. And the, to make a long story short, right, these results are extremely robust and extremely similar to whether you use a proxy that's not affected by endogenous mobility and endogenous uh, labor market entry, or whether you just look at the current state of residence, right, go back to the beginning of their careers and use that unemployment rate there. Right? And so in the main paper, we use both. Where we can, where we have year of birth, we use the double weighted, but we also use information from the CPS where we don't have the year of birth. So the first result, right, comes straight out of this, you know, benchmarking exercise, namely that there is a robust long-term negative effects on learning, right? So this is a very persistent shock. It's very large in the beginning and then reopens in the long term, right? And we, 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 the way we treat this, we treat the short-term initial shocks as exogenous, right? But of course, the long-term earnings response may itself be mediated by adverse family and adverse health outcomes. And so uh, le let me briefly walk you through the mortality effects. Uh, how many minutes do I have left? Um, um, minutes, so a, long, a long time, I think. A bit less, less than 10. Say it again? Uh, let's say eight, no more than eight minutes. Fantastic, thank you. So. What am I going to do? I'm going to, in my la remaining eight minutes, just walk you to the main results and spend maybe a minute at the end discussing them. So I'm going to first talk about mortality uh, because this is maybe the most innovative part of the paper, right? And the part that sort of motivated this use of the, of the double weighted unemployment rate that then turned out to be useful to study effects on other life cycle outcomes. Now, for those of you who don't think about mortality every day, right, there's a, for, for our cohorts, right, for labor market entrants, there's two important phases, right? The initial phase in your 20s, when most of the mortality is caused by accidents, right, which demographers call external causes, right? This is this red line, right? Accidents just jump up in your teenage years, peak, right, just around the 20s, and then sort of hoover at a stable level, oops, throughout the life course. But then as they age, right, disease-related mortality, you know, increases at a, at a very high, at a steady rate, right, and eventually overtakes accident-related mortality just in the mid-30s, which will be a crucial age for us as well. Right? And so what we do, we run exactly the same cell level of regression, right, now with mortality as an outcome instead of with log earnings as an outcome, and we use our double-weighted unemployment rate, the expected unemployment rate as a main measure of the shock. And we look at the shift of that age profile that you just saw for the unlucky you know, graduates from the 82 recession. And this is what you find, right? 
what you find is that there is actually a pretty robust negative effect of mortality in the very short run. The mortality effect hovers around zero from you know, your mid-20s to the mid-30s, and then there is a, a, a steeply increasing mortality effect, right? And you can, we can unpack that effect into disease-related deaths and external causes. And what you see, there's no impact in the short run on disease-related deaths that don't matter that much when people are young, but all the long-term effects that we find is due to disease-related death. And then we see a pretty significant decline in, in, in uh, external causes in the short run. This is consistent with a large literature are now documenting that during a recession, mortality tends to decline, right? So there's a, a, a literature started by Chris Room that's been replicated in many, many countries showing this effect uh, um, for all ages. And we find it here very clearly for labor market inputs as well. And in fact, if you look at, it, at the effect across age, this initial effect tends to be particularly large for people in the 20s. It's all driven by additional, by external causes. But what we see here is that this beneficial short run effect of recessions on mortality doesn't last, right? And 15 years down the line, these unlucky individuals experience increasing mortality rates. And these increasing mortality rates, here you see some evidence on, on mortality by cause, right? Are affected by heart disease, lung cancer, and drug poisoning, right? Which some have, some combination of that has been summarized into death of despair, right? But that's not a separate cause. So what, what you come away with is that there's a, lo a large short-term effect uh, uh, on external causes, which is beneficial, and substantial and steadily increasing effects on, on heart disease, liver disease, lung cancer, and, and drug poisoning, you know, which are, of course, causes of death that are driven by, by health behaviors. And so in the paper, we have a longer discussion of the size of these effects, right? As I said, you know, the, 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 the full 82 recession, which was a large recession, would have left to six to nine month of life expectancy reduction, you know? And for that, we have to, you know, of course, uh, predict how mortality would behave around it through the entire life cycle. These results are very much in line with other findings in the literature. Uh, um, in terms of the order of magnitude. And I'll leave the rest to the discussion. And instead, I'm gonna spend sort of my last few minutes on um, just summarizing what is a very in-depth analysis of the short and long-term effects of uh, uh, adverse labor market entries on a range of outcomes, right? And these are not picked at random, right? These are the, 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 the sort of a classic set of outcomes economists have looked at when sort of thinking about the, the life cycle. And of course, there, 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 there are others, right? But they're just not included in these very large cross-sectional data sets, right? But we do have information on marriage and, 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 and divorce and whether children are in the household. And what is nice that we know information about spouses, right? Um, and that, that'll be interesting. I'm going to start you out uh, with showing you the shifts in the experience gradients for uh, receipt of disability insurance and self-reported labor market related disability and again you know these figures look somewhat noisier right than the mortality gradient which is based on the universe of death records uh, and these are based on a, on a survey right but you clearly see an increase in the rate of uh, work-related disability in the 40s uh, as people hit middle age from this initial shock at age 20. One, one thing I want to point out is that, you know, these long-term earnings losses that you see are driven largely by long-term wage losses. And there's an interesting labor supply pattern where labor supply is low when people are unemployed, higher in middle age, and then lower again later in life. And it looks like there's an important positive income effect on labor supply at some point in middle age. But what's more interesting here is that since individuals have lower earning spouses because they marry spouses in their same cohort, there's less insurance within the family, right? And so 
the effects on household income are actually larger, right? Especially over the long run. So you see the long-term household income effect really dipping down. And then uh, that's one result I wanted to mention. The other one is if you look at the receipt of food stamps, which is a welfare program in the United States and another, uh, the receipt of family welfare, right? Those are particularly large in the short run. And that's all concentrated among lower educated individuals. And there's a flavor here by which everyone is affected, college graduates and high school graduates, but, but the initial effects are just that much larger for high school graduates, something to keep in mind as you're thinking about this recession. The effect on, on marital status and divorce and childbearing are, are here. They're somewhat noisier, but pretty robust. In fact, in the paper, we summarize the effects by decades. But what I want you to take away with is that there's a spike in marriage in the short run, and then a shift in divorce 10 years later as some of these marriages dissolve. And then marital rates in the 40s are lower and divorce rates are higher. And similarly, there's a spike in the number of children in the household early on, and then a long-term decline. And then um, here, I, 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 so overall, right, there's a, a, a decline in long-term socioeconomic outcomes across the board that's numerically actually, you know, meaningful, but not small. And, and the paper walks you through the magnitudes. And with my last minute, I suppose, right, just pointing out that we also look at the heterogeneity in these effects by gender, race, and education. And we want to be careful here, right? Because we're doing a lot of comparisons here, uh, not to sort of over-interpret the data. And that's why the theory is also helpful in harnessing how we think about these estimates, right? But there's some salient difference in the short-run effects. In particular, the short-run earnings and income losses are substantially larger for, for non-whites, right? And for lower educated workers, right? Whereas the short-term rise in marriage and children is mainly for whites and for the higher educated. And so this shifting in marriage patterns and fertility occurs only for whites, but the long run decline in fertility and the long run rise in fertility in, 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 in divorce rates is present for all groups in the labor market. So I'm, I'm ready to conclude right? what we've done, right? we have analyzed socioeconomic outcomes and mortality, right, over the entire life cycle, right, as a function of the initial labor market shocks, right. And to do that, we have to do some extra work to really be able to bring to bear very large repeated cross-section data, right. And with this new approach, we can just generate a whole range of findings related to the shift in life cycle profiles in, in all or aspects of, of individuals, you know, economic and, and family and health lives, right? And that the, the bottom line is that there are very strong shifts throughout the life course. They're large initially, right? There's some adjustment in midlife and then some clear long-term effects as people hit in middle age. And these effects are, are very well predicted by economic life cycle models. And so the impact of entry conditions is just very persistent and, and substantial and really should add into our toolkits and thinking about the, the, the cost of business cycles. And then we can talk a little bit about COVID-19, right? And uh, it, at least in the US, there's a, a large group of new entrants uh, um, and the, in, the, the shock was about double as large as the 82 recession, right? So, you know, you, you can be bold and predict forwards based on these estimates from the past, right? And you would get substantial losses, say, in, in life years or, or, or earnings lost. Right? And then thinking about, so how do we, what, what do we take away here in terms of policy? But right? it's really important to distinguish between the lower and higher educated because they will just experience these shocks differently due to where they are in the income distribution. And I'm going to hold it right there and pass it on to my discussant. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and for keeping the time. Uh, 
Um, so let's move to our uh, last uh, discussant, Agar Brugiavini from University of Venice. Hi. Hi, Agar. Hello, can everyone. You yes. yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. So Excellent. the floor is yours. Uh, you have about 10 minutes. Thank you very much. So, uh, well, uh, this this is a, a, an excellent paper, and so I will be brief because I, I don't have much to say about the quality of the paper. Um, I think uh, we can summarize by saying that uh, it's a, a systematic measure of the effect of initial labor market conditions on life cycle outcomes beyond the effects on the labor market experience itself. Uh, it estimates the causal impact of grad graduating in a recession on midlife and a stress midlife because this is an important point of the paper. And uh, I would focus on health mostly, which is measured by mortality, uh, it, uh, making use of very large data sets that allow for precise estimates and uh, estimate persistence of the negative experience at young ages in several dimensions of life, as it was mentioned by Thiel uh, just now. So as I said, this is a, an excellent paper. Actually, it's a research agenda. It's not just a paper. Um, it's, it's using the data in a very intelligent and informative way. Uh, it brings together different strands of the economic literature and produces a convincing picture of the effects of the US recession of the early 80s. And, uh, it, you know, it, it, it's really hard, as Steele says, to, said, to, to understand this long, medium-term, long-term effects on a large spectrum of uh, outcomes and on, uh, say, credible stories, convincing stories. And what is most relevant is the magnitudes, which are very hard to get in uh, other data sets. So my discussion is not on the technical aspects, uh, but uh, on the message, I think, which is emerging and how this could be completed somehow with uh, alternative approaches or complementary approaches. So discussion here is very hard because for every point that I considered, and I read the paper several times, uh, either they have already done it in the paper itself, or they know someone who has done it. And that's not because, um, you know, uh, it's someone else, but mostly it's because it's still with still one factor with someone else. So it's, it's covering the whole spectrum of possibilities. Um, so data issues is very important here. So we, uh, the, the paper is pulling data from three large sources. Um, and what are the advantages vis-a-vis -vis panel data, which are typically the data we would use for life cycle studies, right? It's large cross-section time series data, which allows us to obtain relatively thick cells. Because one of the, the problems with panel data is that we easily run into very tiny cells. It's stretching for approximately 1980 to 2019, so sort a of very long period of time. It's avoiding some attrition biases, but when we talk about mortality, I would be a little bit careful because they're stopping around age 40, 50, but as we go along, mortality is going to be an issue for this data set as well. It's suitable to assess the effects of macroshocks so uh, this is a problem we have in longitudinal data, which covers typically small periods of time. And so macro shocks may be overestimated on, on panel data. But I would say by and large, the most uh, sort of uh, valuable piece of uh, information is that you can count the deaths because in panel data it's very hard and in cross section it's very hard to count the, the deaths. Um, and it's, it's a big, you know, uh, part of the literature by demographers to how to actually count deaths in uh, survey data. 
disadvantages are uh, it's not controlling for all the individual heterogeneity, at least not yet, uh, because the, here you have to unpack the data as much as possible, but there is a, a point where you cannot go beyond uh, unpacking this data because you don't observe some of the facts in life of people. And I would point to three uh, aspects. One is the early conditions in life, which I think are relevant here. And the other is the accumulation over the life cycle. And here I'm thinking about actual experiences versus potential experience. And the role of idiosyncratic shocks and how they contribute to the temporary or permanent scars that these uh, early shocks are causing. And here I'm a little worried about the dynamics because it's true, we are following the dynamics of these people, but you know, one thing is to unpack the average, and one thing is to unpack the variance. It's very hard to, to aggregate the individual dynamics in a, in a very uh, effective way. Uh, and again, I would be careful on selectivity in longevity because selective longevity, because again, this is a problem in panel data, but I think it's a problem here that in a different way. The mechanism for mortality is that uh, uh, health capital is uh, built uh, as a result of the investment. And the more you make investment, the higher your health stock, uh, but not working could be beneficial. And that's the funny sort of short run effect that we see funny. I mean, the, the interesting short run effect that we see in, in many studies, because maybe during recessions you have more time to dedicate to yourself, or you have less activities, you drive less, whatever. Uh, the problems, I think, that would require further attention here is the initial health stock. So how are these people coming to age 20 with their health stock? I, I'm, I, I'm not convinced that, uh, I'm not totally convinced that people are coming all the same at age 20 and the cumulative effects of behavioral risks, some of these are picked up in the study, but again, I think you may pick up smoking age 12 or age 13, and that's something that stays with you much longer than if you start at age 25 or 30. And uh, the unlucky workers story, which I think is, is uh, the core of the paper, and uh, so we have these lucky people and these lucky pe unlucky people, I would say, the unlucky ones. And these are lucky ones basically sort of, you know, uh, are hit by the recession with the 20 and they don't recover essentially by this, uh, or they, they recover less than the others because the others are accumulating human capital much faster than they do. They're more effective and they sort of overcome these unlucky ones. So how do we sort of investigate more this topic? Um, first, I would ask who are the parents of the unlucky workers? And, um, you know, uh, my intuition is that if you are from a wealthy family in an unlucky state in the US, you're really much better off kid uh, because you're, you have a starting life when you're very young, which is much better than anyone else around you. And these kids would not be thinking about migrating uh, for sure. So this is the positive selection, right? That would be sort of missing somehow in, in the story, but it, I don't want to go into details. And then, as I said, the cumulative effects of job actual experience. But I think my main point in this discussion is that we need more recessions to, to, to judge this data in a sort of, and, and, and Till has done a lot of work on this. So there are surely pieces of his work which, which will show this point, but I want to make it a bit more general. Uh, this 1980, 1982 recession was a, a double deep recession. China had become a serious competitor and it was called also a jobless recovery recession, driven, the, 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 the recovery was driven by new technology. So some of the jobs that were existing at that time disappeared afterwards in the US. So who are the workers who didn't make it back to this uh, sort of recovery periods? And 
I want to show you this picture. This is the unemployment rate for the US over the sort of uh, 20 years period, more or even more. So the first recession, 1974, is you know um, oil price shock. The second one, with this double dip, you see 1980 and then 1982, um, is the one studied in in the in the report in the in the paper. Okay. Um, and, and then we're going to the new one. So this, um, these recessions, I think, are very different in a sense. Um, uh, and I think we have to we have to understand, uh, you know, what are the consequences uh, in terms of which what was the technological shock behind this, uh, which came after this these recessions. And here is work from Till himself. Uh, look at the uh, sort of the cumulative earnings losses after displacement versus the unemployment rate. You see that the 1982-1983 recession is a very special one. I mean, it's a very extreme one, if not special. But, you know, the, you have the highest unemployment rate uh, with a sort of uh, minus three, the, the, you know, the worst uh, result in terms of loss in earnings. And indeed, people said that it would not be easy to find comparable jobs. So these people were completely discouraged, I think. I don't think they even thought of migrating, and this would be the, you know, on the negative side of the, of the story. I'll, I'll, um, I'll be fast now. Um, so perhaps a, good, a different recession would, uh, you know, would help. And also, what if the unlucky young people are the children of the unlucky parents of the first recession? That I would like to see, because I think there might be some persistence in, in that when these cohorts arrive to age 20. The most interesting result, I would think, of the paper is this on uh, midlife mortality. And it has to be midlife because uh, we're looking at people who were 20 in 1982, so we're now seeing them in their 40, 45, whatever. And, um, and see, you see the long-term impact of, uh, of the recession on mortality. And you, although there could be a temporary sort of uh, positive effect of being unemployed, for sure, being unemployed in the long term affects your mortality. So um, I think this is very comforting, very very important result. And these are tiny numbers, however, you know, we, we look at about one or two deaths of, uh, out of 10,000. And indeed, you saw the variance increasing quite a lot, uh, the confidence interval. So these results are very important to establish what is going on because we don't see in panel data these numbers. I mean, you don't see the one, two deaths in, in panel data. That's what is very hard. And the causes of that. But by construction, you're not seeing yet the, 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 you know, the, what happens afterwards, which they extrapolate a bit in the paper, but you, know, you really want to see what happens age 55, 60, when death kicks in really hard. So in the shared data, we do see the shared data is the survey of health, aging, and retirement in Europe. And I'm showing you this because this was in a report of the Fondazione Rodolfo de Benedetti a few years ago. This is the analog, if you like, of the unemployment shock. So the people experience in Europe the unemployment shock from recessions uh, in their 20s as well. Okay, same, same so story as in Till's paper. And these are the effects, you know, uh, very much in line with what was found by Till uh, for the US. Uh, health problems, un um, divorce, blah, blah. But uh, to finish, um, I want to say something about, um, so to, the shared data would confirm, by the way, that if you go a little bit further in time, like uh, six, age 60, 65, health has a negative, uh, has a negative, uh, it, uh, recessions, unemployment has a negative effect on health in the long run. So it's totally in line with the results. But I think there is, a, uh, there is a puzzle that we have to solve. Um, and uh, so let's talk about women here. And, you know, Teal is bringing along some other evidence from, um, say, Curry and Schwant 2014 about completed fertility for women exposed to the recession. Uh, and um, 
careers, uh, these continuities are obviously very important for, for women. So I was a little surprised actually not to see much stronger effects for women than for men. And this is a puzzle and I want to bring some of the evidence by Lisa Berkman, who is um, an epidemiologist and a sociologist uh, who works on uh, survival and longevity. I don't know if you can see this, maybe it's a little small, but to, to give you the intuition, this is the life expectancy uh, and you see life expectancy for women increases in, in, in sorry, all Sorry in to all interrupt countries. you. I, um, unfortunately, there was a technical problem with the slides, so we cannot see them. If you can make comments without referring to the graph, maybe it will be clearer. Sorry about that. Or oh, otherwise, a, you, have to share. You, are, you have to share your presentation. I was sharing my presentation, sorry. I was not. So you didn't see any of the slides I was talking about? No. Why didn't you tell me before? <laughs> okay, so, well, um, I don't know what to say. Um, this this um, graph uh, would be interesting to see because it shows uh, the um, okay. Let me see if I do it. Can you see them now? No, no, we cannot. Okay. Um, so, sorry about that. Can you go straight to the conclusions? Yes, well, the conclusions we are, really are simply that. that there is this puzzle, I think, about the uh, survival of women, uh, because women in the US don't seem to have the advantage in survival that uh, all the other countries experienced. And one of the stories that is brought about is the stress that people experienced uh, during working life. So American women are very much like American men in the sense they started working at the same age, they went through the same behavioral risks and probably had stress during their working life. So uh, because of the combined effect of uh, working and, uh, and family chores. So, if that's the case, we, I, I was wondering whether we can extend this work by till into the early kind of retirement story and see whether for these women then early retirement could be a relief, which would go against a lot of research that has been done on you know, work, retirement and health. So I'm going to clo close here, thank you. Okay, let me check if uh, Till has some comments to make on the discussion. Yes, uh, very briefly. So, thank you for that. Are you still online? Discussion. Can you hear me? We cannot uh, hear you. The okay. mic. Yes. Can you now hear me we, now? Now we can, yes. Fantastic. So, thank you for that excellent discussion. Um, and, uh, you know, you raised several important points. The one, one thing that i just like to highlight, so I think the question about how women fare at the end of the recession is particularly interesting, and in particular, how has that been changing over time, right? In the U.S., the increase in labor force participation of women was very steep in the 70s especially for higher educated women, but, and it was still ongoing for lower educated women in the 80s. So it would be very interesting to see how the, the female response differs across recessions relative to those of men, right? And I also think going back further in time to then being able to look at what happens as individuals hit retirement age is extremely interesting. And there's a bit of a hurdle in the US in the sense that one has to reconstruct state-level unemployment rates going further back, which is which can be done, right, 
it just adds sort of one layer of measurement. And so in a way we took stock of the method and of sort of the, that workhorse recession in the early eighties here, right. And are planning to go back to, you know, you mentioned the 1975 recession, which was sort of a first big recession in the United States, not quite as big as the early eighties recession, but that is a great recession to study. And we have thought about going even further back. Um, one thing I do want to say that the notion that, you know, the 82 recession might be very different than other recession comes up frequently. And it's a very natural question in the sense that it, you know, from 80 onwards, right, there's been a lot of discussion of technological changes, the industrialization, you know, in the nineties, there was, you know, the, the, the China shock and increasing trade. And so we have done a lot of sensitivity around that issue in particular to make sure that our state level shocks of the early 80s are not strongly correlated or correlated at all for that matter with other shocks that that came afterwards you know i do think that um you know you you you, you quoted you, you had that that figure of mine um that you mentioned from our brokings paper on the effect of job loss right that there's a, a, a bit of a difference between, for job losers and labor market influence. At least in the US, recessions sometimes start or have a particular effect in certain sectors, and then they become, a, they lead to a decline in job finding rates across the board, right? So there might be certain job losers that come from high wage sectors that get a particular large hit, right? But for labor market entrance, they all start in a period with very low job finding rates. And that's not specific to the early 80s recession. That occurred in the 90s, the 2001, the 2008 recession. And in a way, the, the beauty of US recessions is that there are sort of, there are common patterns, right? And there's, the, the, especially log earnings, which is an important outcome for us, varies quite systematically with the local labor market. And it does so in a similar fashion in different recessions. And that's true for job losers and for labor market entrance. And so we did, and I couldn't show this to you, but we did look at the longer term impacts from each of the following recession, 82, early 90s, 2000, 2008. And these long term effects look actually quite similar um, from these different recessions. So I'm, I'm confident that we have sort of something that's informative, that's not sort of just episodic, right? But I do find it particularly interesting to look at these uh, effects for women because their labor force participation has been changing. And, you know, the last thing I'll say is that Agar has done really interesting and important work to look at, you know, the early, earlier conditions in, 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 in life and long-term outcomes. And it would be really interesting to connect the two is thinking who is resilient as sort of a shock in the, the, the 20s hits, right? And going back to, you know, those earlier life experiences and looking at shock resilience, in particular when it comes to labor market shock, I think is a, is a great uh, avenue for, for further research, right? We, we have the difficulties that we don't see family uh, outcomes or family background in, in, the, in, in our data, but that would be uh, really interesting to see. So thank you again for that, for that great discussion. Thank you, thank you. So we are we are a bit late, so we unfortunately we skip the the coffee break and we move directly to the next uh, session. For those who really really need a coffee, there is a coffee served outside, but you have to go out very discreetly. <laughs> and uh, while we set up the next uh, session, thank you very much. Ai due estremi possiamo non mettere la mascherina. Poi lei già mi è microfonato? Ah, vabbè, allora ci giriamo. Possiamo avere un altro microfono per
Questa è una sessione in italiano, per cui eh, those of you who uh, do not speak Italian are asked to, to get... No, perché c'è anche il ministro. Diciamo tutto in italiano. Ecco qua, vediamo la versione. Bene, eh, oggi abbiamo affrontato diverse dimensioni. Eh. Ok, then, so today we have faced the different dimensions of the effects of the school closings. And uh, we, talked, we, we talked about the effect of school closures on contagion, the reduction of COVID, the mortality rates. And, uh, you know, at the same time, we have talked about the effects of that. Uh, all of this has on the uh, participation and involvement into the uh, labor market, especially uh, from women. And uh, we also touched upon another key item. So we've shown evidence of the, uh, uh, let's say, evolution on the uh, uh, levels of instruction or schooling. So the impact of that school closures had on, uh, let's say, um, learnings from, from children. Um, after the presentation from uh, Till uh, from Bachter, uh, well, we know that there are many other dimensions that we have to take into account, apart from those we have explored today, which are really very important. So, once again, uh, we have talked uh, uh, with Fabrizio Zilli of all of the effects that we can have, social interaction. This has to do with, you know, uh, school uh, being closed and then segregation and so on and so forth. So once again, Telefon uh, Wachter gave us an important contribution from the methodological point of view because he told us how we can look at the possible, you know, long-term effects because this is what we have to expect. I mean, what we are observing today will have long-term, you know, uh, effects. So uh, we need to, uh, well, to have time to see those, you know, consequences. So once again, it is now too early. But of course, uh, um, we got important indications on how to use a cross-sectional data in order to uh, see the evolution of all of these phenomena in the future. So in a way, we'll be, be able to, uh, you know, keep talking about this. So I'd like to talk about this. I mean, all of this uh, tells us that it's really very important now to uh, find new measures, I mean, to take up all of these challenges and hopefully win them. We have to do this right now, otherwise uh, we will, uh, you know, have to experience long-term and negative effects. So in this roundtable, in this final uh, discussion, we have two uh, important authoritative speakers we would like to talk to, and then of course we can also get questions from the audience. Uh, the first one is Elena Bonetti. Now, Mrs. Bonetti, uh, is the Minister for uh, Equal Opportunities Buonasera. and Family. Thank you so much for being with us. Now, the uh, paper that's been presented this afternoon highlights that the consequences of uh, school closing in terms of participation into the job market and, you know, salary differences. I mean, consequences have been so heavy for women. Um, there was a possibility that's been offered to uh, parents. I mean, the fact of, uh, you know, uh, taking advantage of, you know, COVID-19 special leaves. This has been used almost exclusively by women. So the take up rate from men has been very low. So once again, all of these leaves uh, had the consequences on a worsening, you know, career perspectives for women, and in some cases, the wages reductions for women. Now, here in Italy, we've been working to rebalance the situation uh, in terms of, you know, using uh, better the uh, uh, parents, you know, uh, parental leaves. So we also try to uh, uh, increase the number of parental leaves 
And in this case, the key condition is to have a better allocation. So we have to remove the asymmetry. And uh, so once again, uh, children rearing should be something to be shared between, uh, you know, uh, mother and father. So once again, we have to share responsibilities within family. And I have to say that this focus on gender differences in terms of using um, leaves, well, apparently this hasn't happened. So um, after reopening schools, uh, there are new, there are again the possibility to use, uh, you know, leaves or parental leaves or even father's leaves and so so also in terms of COVID leaves, do we have to implement the same approach? I mean, the approach we uh, followed for parental leaves, I mean, encouraging men or fathers to take advantage of these leaves instead of only having mothers do this. So what can we do to improve the system? Grazie, grazie. Intanto buonasera, Ma, all, buonasera a tutti. So much, allora, eh, io distinguerei diciamo due linee di intervento. So La prima eh, riguarda il fatto di eh, disegnare in uh, forma dei congedi in, parentali you know, uh, che vada esattamente nella direzione che abbiamo indicato. Uh, È vero che uh, uh, oggi nel nostro paese ci sono alcune delle regole attuali, alcuni elementi di flessibilità che possono indurre una favorire un processo che favorisca il congedo di paternità, ma sono del tutto insufficienti. Abbiamo negli ultimi anni, negli ultimi tre anni, due leggi di bilancio, ha aumentato in modo significativo il congedo obbligatorio di paternità, siamo arrivati a dieci giorni nell'ultima legge di bilancio, è mia intenzione nella prossima, ho già chiesto che non solo venga rifinanziato, ma aumentato questo periodo di obbligo di congedo di paternità. In realtà, attuale dei, dei congedi Now, non, è, non è sufficientemente system, paritario, intanto uh, perché non c'è un congedo respect, di paternità uh, you know, sufficientemente comparabile con quello di maternità. E questo crea una disparità, diciamo, di di inizio nel mondo del lavoro da parte delle donne, perché per un'azienda assumere una donna, assumere un uomo, significa avere un costo potenziale di maternità per un congedo di maternità più lungo che deve sostenere con una sostituzione che a sua volta è onerosa per l'azienda. Nell'ambito del cambiamento si vuole riformare tutti i congedi parentali con l'intento della parità e della piena condivisione dei cari di cultura familiare, pur ovviamente nella differenza dei diritti e delle specificità del ruolo di una donna e del ruolo di un uomo nell'esercizio della maternità. Una donna che ha il ciclo di maternità obbligatoria le ha anche a tutela della sua salute fisica dopo il parto, quindi non è la salute anche del minore per quanto riguarda la maternità, quindi c'è una complessità più ampia, ma è evidente che noi dobbiamo aumentare eh, il carico di cura da parte dei padri. Questo lo si fa parlando del progetto di paternità, introducendo elementi più significativi e consistenti di premialità, come quelli che lei ha indicato, è una retribuzione adeguata dei congedi di paternità e di maternità, in generale dei congedi parentali. Oggi i congedi dopo sei anni sono dei congedi eh, che sono di fatto assunti, ma ci sono a titolo gratuito e fino ai 12 anni di età, laddove il carico di cura di custodia, l'impegno di custodia per la legge penale fino ai 14 anni. Quindi è evidente che è una eh, norma che nel so, suo complesso deve essere riformata, questo lo fa il premiato con alcune indicazioni precise. Quindi certamente io penso che il meccanismo che lei suggeriva, cioè una premialità laddove è possibile rispetto al fatto che il carico venga condiviso dai due genitori, quindi è un processo positivo, perché la legge spesso attiva processi non solo con gli obblighi, ma anche con le premialità. Questo credo che sia uno degli indirizzi importanti. Non dobbiamo però dimenticarci che quando parlavo della retribuzione si deve fare fare riferimento al fatto che oggi noi abbiamo stipendi delle donne e degli uomini diversi, con un peso diverso, purtroppo il gap salariale è molto alto nel nostro paese, soprattutto nel settore privato. Questo cosa significa? Che se una famiglia deve rinunciare a una parte dello stipendio, penso magari agli stipendi sui quali c'è la differenza poi rispetto al carico familiare e alle finanze di una famiglia, rinunciare ad un prezzo dello stipendio, dello stipendio più alto è faticoso, è più faticoso. 
molto più difficile rispetto allo stipendio più basso. Quindi un altro elemento che sembra sconnesso e non lo è, è quello del colmare il gap salariale tra le donne e gli uomini e dare diciamo, quindi un incentivo da questo punto di vista anche rispetto ai congedi di paternità. Servono congedi anche più flessibili eh, perché e in qualche modo anche interscambiati. Per quanto riguarda invece quello che è successo nel periodo Covid, il discorso lì è stato non nascondo che in una prima fase avevo valutato, avevamo valutato come governo l'introduzione di meccanismi di premialità di questo tipo. Ci siamo trovati però di fronte alla gestione di un'emergenza. Noi abbiamo obbligato i genitori a, a, di fatto a rimanere a casa perché le scuole sono state chiuse in presenza. Abbiamo esteso eh, la retribuzione, siamo arrivati nelle finanze che avevamo a disposizione al 50%, per molto più di quello che adesso è previsto, soprattutto fino a 14 anni di età, quindi il 50% dello stipendio fino ai 14 anni di età, abbiamo specificato che ci fosse la possibilità di prenderlo in modo anche alternativo, anche favorendo questo scambio, avessimo imposto eh, diciamo, di prenderlo in modo paritario sarebbe stato potenzialmente un carico aggravante sulle finanze delle famiglie che erano già approvate dalla società Quindi è chiaro che non è la soluzione ottimale, quella che è stata trovata è stata un po' un'ottimizzazione vincolata rispetto alle condizioni emergenziali. In via stabile invece sono assolutamente d'accordo che si debba andare nella direzione che lei auspicava ed è esattamente lo spirito e i principi che sono inseriti nella riforma dell'economia. Bisogno di avere altre chiusure delle scuole. Ok, well, hopefully uh, it won't be necessary to close schools again. So today we talked about the uh, pre-vaccination, uh, you know, uh, COVID situation. I have read some fresh numbers and figures from the UK. Now in the UK, once again, unfortunately, uh, there's still, you know, contagion uh, in schools. So in some areas of the country, they are closing schools uh, once again. So we have to be uh, ready and we have to make sure there are no strong penalties, if you will, against women because, I mean, these drawbacks or penalties may have long-term effects. So what you told us today is very important. Now, the way to face the problem, so the difference in terms of income between men and women, well, of course, in a way, we have to, uh, uh, of course, uh, It would be great, I mean, to, to have di paternità, nel caso dei, dei congedi di paternità uh, c'è una retribuzione al, effettivamente al 100%. In realtà io, yes, sempre esatto. nel, nel, nel familiare, in generale, penso che anche il congedo di maternità vada uh, al 100%, speaking, proprio the perché la decontribuzione delle sostituzioni di maternità per le imprese, il fatto che le imprese non debbano pagare l'integrazione con la quale per arrivare al 100% dello stipendio è un elemento che colma invece il potenziale di vario è something filling a gap in the disadvantage of women in the labor market. Until we perceive, we see the maternity leave as a limit, as a cost, it will be difficult to have an inversion in the demographic trend, whereas it should become something shared and collected for the country. As for schools, you are totally right. We are trying to extend this to other workers because we talk about, about employees, but you know, talking about parental leave so is not maybe the right word because also freelancers and independent workers uh, should, um, you know, find uh, ways not only uh, for uh, their family and uh, not only leaves, uh, but also to make up for all the needs that they have in terms of education and in terms of childcare. But generally speaking, as for the schools, uh, um, uh, I actually asked uh, for, say, the number of days required uh, for uh, students uh, and uh, uh, teachers to stay at home uh, waiting for a test, uh, so the quarantine. Because, uh, you know, even in the labor market, Uh, nobody should be excluded uh, and uh, not the uh, in particular women should not be excluded and there was another thing that emerged from these studies uh, that was uh, uh, un 
highlighted mainly by Giulia Bovini, the fact that there are very strong differences in the access to leaves uh, uh, according to the size of the companies. Um, this means that uh, in larger companies, uh, people can benefit from maternity and uh, parental leaves in general, whereas for smaller enterprises, this is much more difficult and this uh, entails problems for the families. I don't know if this comes from uh, a problem with the contractual power uh, of workers or if uh, they have, uh, you know, the companies have find it more difficult to uh, find alternatives in case of absence. Uh, uh, and I think this is a very uh, serious problem in terms of, uh, you know, uh, application, implementation of this kind of uh, action. So have you thought or sì, have you drafted any della, proposals in this sense? Tema, diciamo, I totally agree with you that uh, the uh, size of the company sul, really affects uh, the overall welfare of uh, parental leaves included. These parental leaves, uh, in particular during COVID, were not connected to any kind of uh, contract or negotiations, but uh, um, the, uh, for example, during the pandemic, the uh, right to uh, work from home um, was also um, recognized, so it was uh, uh, a possibility um, in, given in order to uh, keep uh, the same amount of salary, but considering that the tools that we have today are not suitable and not adequate, uh, we are currently reforming the family policies in general. How can we do? I think that uh, um, small and medium enterprises uh, are really the uh, Core, che, the structure eh, of uh, our country, it is clear that family policies uh, um, represent costs uh, for uh, companies uh, because, you know, uh, a large companies uh, have to cope with the absence uh, of uh, a worker and this should be managed uh, in the overall management uh, of human resources and I think of maternity leave because, you know, the large companies, if they is a woman asking for a maternity leave, this woman shall be replaced. Uh, and this is easier for larger companies, but much more difficult for smaller companies because, first, they have to pay for uh, part of the salary of the woman. And then the um, uh, for the replacement and also requalify the replacing uh, workers. So this is uh, a serious burden for uh, small enterprises and that's why it's more complicated both for men and for women uh, in small uh, companies to access this kind of uh, tools. So what have we done and what will we do? On one side we would like to uh, avoid uh, um, making companies bear the cost for this kind of maternity leaves so that it's not a sort of penalty uh, for the company uh, to have women that ask for maternity leaves, you know. Uh, on the other side, uh, we should uh, include um, defiscalization and uh, tax incentives um, that can um, la presenza degli uomini dall'altro lato poi in una premialità di equality uh, and equality between men and women between genders uh, not only at work but also in terms of education so that they can uh, also if you want to take care of their own children if needed um, and continue their work in life without needing to renounce it and as for the maternity leaves the maternity leaves uh, should be included in the career of a worker and I think of uh, general uh, parental leaves, uh, maternity and paternity leaves. What happens today, uh, a woman can benefit from a five-month leave, which is mandatory, and then after this five months, considering the lack of services, the lack of nurseries, um, 
And uh, also the fact that from an economic point of view there's a difference in uh, salary, well there is not such a big difference let's say in staying at home or in earning a salary. So very often that woman is not encouraged to go back to work. So this is uh, something negative for women employment on one hand, but on the other uh, it's also a benefit if you want uh, companies because uh, this woman uh, stops working, but very often after the birth of one child, most of women stop working and they go back to the, work in the labor market sorry, after two years. So on one hand we are working for maternity leaves and on the other we are thinking of economic support for women to go back immediately to work. Mm, so after they maternity leave, so increasing uh, services are delivered and facilities and also incentives to afford the companies to uh, qualify the competencies of a woman also during the maternity leave, going back with the reskilling and with the right things. This kind of things cannot be uh, done at the moment very easily. And this uh, would have benefit also in terms of productivity at work. And what you said goes beyond. The, the COVID situation because, you know, discrimination and employment uh, um, and the choice between men and women are very, very frequent, uh, especially for small and medium enterprises. Um, I would like to ask you to stay with us for a moment, uh, even if we uh, move to uh, Mr. Roberto Ricci for what moment to talk more specifically about school, because I know that later on there will be questions from the public for you. Uh, thank you uh, for or what you um, have uh, said so far, how you contributed so far. So, President Ricci, there are two main questions, in my opinion, um, that uh, have been raised today, uh, and I would like to start our conversation on that. First, uh, it's a factual thing. Uh, we noticed this decline in dropout, which, uh, uh, well, well, you know, when we started looking at data, we thought that uh, dropouts would have increased, whereas we noticed that dropouts uh, dropped, especially in people between, especially in students moving from one year to another and not within the same year. This increase is maybe due to the fact that uh, there were, uh, let me say, lighter um, penalties sometimes, or the fact that, uh, um, well, uh, schools um, didn't take maybe the same measures and then as in the past, um, in terms of, um, you know, failed years and so on. So uh, maybe there will be a problem in the future years resulting from this uh, uh, situation. So this is my first reflection. And the second thing is, uh, Mm, something more optimistic, if you want to. Uh, we should uh, think more positively uh, and uh, consider the fact that uh, um, home learning had some negative effects, and we saw that there were negative effects also in other countries, also in terms of learning and inequalities, and we have mentioned a lot of reasons for that. But on the other side, uh, if home learning uh, is used not as a replacement but as a mm, completion if you want to complete uh, the, the normal uh, school learning could it be also an instrument that would allow uh, some people to recover and I mean especially people living in the margin of society what do you think about that what is your opinion thank you uh, so first of all uh, good evening to everyone uh, as for um, school dropout uh, uh, well uh, I would have been surprised if it was the other way around because there is dropout at school when a student sees that uh, it's not very uh, likely that he or she uh, passes to the following year and so they drop out. So the uh, probability not to go to the next grade um, has um, decreased, and so 
This is not just because, you know, the debt has been covered, but because the payment for this debt has been su suspended. So sooner or later, it will have to be repaid, uh, talking in economical terms. And uh, there are some data showing that uh, um, the direction we're following is this. Uh, I don't remember exactly who of you mentioned this point, but uh, we focused on um, inner phenomena of dropout, um, that is the number of students completing higher schools. Um, and they do it by achieving skills that are not even comparable to, to what we should expect. So this is, yes, if they get a diploma, they have skills, uh, basic skills, I would say, that uh, uh, well, you know, are comparable to the end of the second year of school or even to the end of uh, middle school, secondary schools. So before the pandemic in 2019, uh, at a national level, the situation was at about 7% and it went up to 9.5%. And the definition that we adopt, the definition of uh, implicit school dropout, um, is con related to this, and it's a very restrictive one um, because uh, there are lot of lots of false negatives uh, because implicit dropouts. Uh, are, in our opinion, are according to our definition, the, the students that achieve these very low results uh, in the five year uh, of high school. So the reason why there is this uh, um, apparent uh, drop uh, in the number of general dropouts uh, uh, is actually related to this. As for homeschooling or um, home learning, uh, I am firmly convinced uh, of one point, and I think that uh, this also underlines uh, the positive side of uh, uh, home learning. I think that uh, what we call dad, so the home uh, learning, um, should be um, like, uh, you know, um, recognized and awarded, if you want, by every municipality, uh, because um, this kind of learning, remote learning, for sure, uh, was able to do a lot, but it's an emergency solution. So what we observed is not due to uh, that. Uh, uh, so remote learning is not guilty of that. Uh, but it's just a way to cope with what happened. And uh, for sure, uh, teachers uh, really did whatever possible to um, have the utmost uh, uh, results. Uh, if you think of my generation, if this had happened uh, when I was at school, there wouldn't have been not even a dialogue with our teachers. So let's think of that and let's think of uh, remote learning as a potential and uh, as a help for um, students that would require different uh, um, types of learning. If we think of the hinterland, so um, uh, about 22 million people in Italy living in the inner areas, and very often it's difficult, for example, to, you know, offer school in the afternoon for these children. Well, in this case, uh, remote learning should be interesting, could be interesting. Whereas, uh, uh, if you think uh, of uh, other uh, aspects related to this, there are some positive things, uh, and uh, this is undeniable. I was also very uh, surprised uh, uh, by the um, various uh, variable, variables involved. Uh, 
Uh, and also what uh, Telephone Factor said really impressed me because, you know, maybe we would uh, expect uh, this kind of results, but seeing it um, is something that uh, is extremely impactful. So it is very important to have data available because when you see those data, when you see those results, it's much more powerful and significant than just uh, thinking, estimating it. And I also think that it's necessary to have some sort of alliance between the different uh, um, subjects the different uh, players. It was wonderful for me to listen to the various speakers and see how important uh, it is to do research. Uh, and I immediately thought of uh, moments that are different from this one, moments that are part of my everyday work and life where you should not take for granted that uh, these data are available because lately the uh, public administration have improved, but the uh, general public uh, only uh, considers school as of something of today and uh, tomorrow at maximum with no longer term approach, whereas it is right to consider a phenomenon with the perspective in the long term. So uh, having data is not considered a priority. So imagine what would have happened if this data were not available. We wouldn't have had this kind of research. This said, uh, I just want to add that um, um, the best way to keep on having data is to have a communication and communicate actually a word different from what uh, from what we have now. So, um, it is very important that uh, also the general public is aware of this. Uh, for sure, um, I think that, uh, well, uh, there are different things related to the method um, that can be considered and that we can share them also with those have a different approach and uh, who do not have a research approach. And last but not least, we might also sum everything up by saying that uh, if we have the right education, the right kind of school, we also um, make the life of our students longer in a way. And I think that this kind of message is fundamental. Well, I think that what you're saying is paramount of paramount importance. Uh, I totally agree with you, um, especially on this uh, effects that we see at a microeconomic level, uh, effects uh, on salaries, effects uh, on health, uh, um, and also macro effects. Uh, it is clear that there are uh, a lot of things that are related. Um, and, and we looked at labor market, we looked at different sectors and how the pandemic a role and how the quality of learning could have been improved. Uh, generally speaking, um, we, I can say that, uh, well, uh, maybe we wouldn't have expected uh, uh, that the school responded so well and also the Valsi uh, text responded so well uh, during the period of the pandemic. So uh, generally speaking, the results were um, very good. Um, I'm sure that there will be questions. There are questions uh, for both the minister and for the president Roberto Ricci. So, well, let's start uh, with the first uh, two questions. Um, can you take the microphone? 
So, first, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the um, speakers, uh, the speeches of the final panel in particular. A couple of things about what uh, President Ricci was saying um, about the inner parts of Italy. I think it's something very interesting because very often when we deal with data, we focus on the differences between the north and the south of the country, uh, which is something relevant, significant, uh, but very often there are important differences between the uh, mm, you know suburbs and the uh, center, the, the the, the towns or cities, uh, but mm, there's another important thing to consider, which is the um, broadband uh, coverage, uh, which can be different in the different parts of Italy. The other thing uh, is uh, related to dropout. Uh, we talked about uh, high school, and I think that it's very interesting to notice that, uh, well, last year, uh, there were uh, enrollments, more enrollments in universities, so they have uh, increased. So maybe the number of people graduating from high school um, maybe was the same as in previous years, whereas the crisis, the recession, uh, has um, um, made people think of university as a place where to, um, you know, find uh, some... Uh, shelter if you want and so there was this difference in the passage between the high school and the university which is uh, something that we should uh, add uh, in my opinion to what mr richie was saying uh, earlier on thank you thank you for your suggestions for sure the topic of hinterland and uh, inner parts of italy is uh, of paramount importance um you know, we should have a more granular uh, point of view because if you think uh, of the difference between cities and uh, uh, suburbs, uh, well, even within the cities themselves, uh, there are uh, areas that are outer and inner areas and so that where there are differences. So uh, there are lots of, lots of things to consider. But um, uh, I can say that, uh, uh, as for the second thing that we were saying uh, about more people going to university, uh, I'm convinced that if you spend even just one minute more in your life in education, that's a, a well-spent minute. Um, I also think uh, that at some point uh, um, we will have to understand uh, if we were able to make the students, get the students to complete, to achieve uh, their studies. And I think that this is uh, the uh, uh, most important thing to consider in terms of future perspectives. Um, and, uh, well, um, if you think of uh, what I was saying earlier about education, uh, the pandemic has um, exacerbated some problems that are deeply rooted in our country and uh, in our past, uh, and not only in our country, actually. So there is a very big problem also in terms uh, of uh, um, uh, Mm, a, a big problem related to the passage from high school and university. And there is a paradox um, in 2020 and in 2021, we saw that uh, at the end of high school, the scores were much higher um, than before the pandemic. Uh, so uh, I can understand why, but we are not actually doing the good of our young people. So that's what I... Uh, like to add, maybe there will be drop out uh, uh, phenomena in the future at university um, because you know maybe also with the economy recovering uh, uh, there will be changes. Marta, another question. Yes, I have a question for Minister Bonetti. And uh, I was thinking of the positive legacy of the pandemic uh, and I would like to focus mainly on that. For sure, we are trying to make uh, um, the, the fact of working from home, from remote, uh, more easy and accessible uh, to workers. And uh, uh, I don't know if this can exacerbate the difference uh, and the gap between uh, men and women and uh, work and life, uh, work life and family life balance. Uh, have you um, 
thoughts about this, about this uh, um, eh, use of dunque, working eh, from home, smart working? Well, I totally eh, agree with uh, 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 what uh, uh, the President uh, has eh, just uh, underlined. Del, the uh, pandemic has, has uh, revealed the inefficiencies uh, that exist in our country. country. And at the same time, it has imposed some transitions, some change in the reorganization of working life by introducing the uh, possibility of working from home. Um, so, on one hand, some processes uh, were necessary and were uh, to be uh, implemented in the right way, so it's very important to promote uh, an adequate uh, training, to use digital tools, to use digital technologies, and so the country really needs uh, um, this digital transition. And uh, one of the main axes that we are following in at the European level in the next generation EU is actually the uh, digital transformation. On the other side, if you think of the personal uh, stories of women during the pandemic, I think that uh, the fatigue they showed was profound because in that case, it was not uh, smart working. Uh, so it was not smart, it was just working from home with a lot of uh, limitations because it was just uh, recreating an office within the uh, household. So very often the spaces were inadequate, there was childcare um, and the family life to um, balance. And this uh, revealed that uh, uh, for smart working to be very smart, the approach should be um, uh, you know, more based on the objectives than on the time during the day, on the working time. Uh, there should be a better coordination in terms of mobility, in terms of spaces. Um, so, um, both the public administrations and the private world are working uh, on the reorganization of the labor market in order to make it more efficient but also more human. What does it mean to have a di vision, more human way? That it means that uh, there can, can be, be no gender discrimination per, because Working from home doesn't mean just stay at home, but it means to find a space in one's personal life in which the uh, working life is, um, uh, takes part um, and find a balance between the personal life and the child care, the school. So I think that organizing the work in life uh, uh, like this would um, allow for a better integration between work in life and family life, a better balance. Uh, um, we worked a lot on this, we uh, encouraged and we um, set up some incentives for companies who decide to continue with organizing their work uh, by uh, benefiting from smart work you know, the possibility of work, working from home. And uh, as also Minister Neta said, uh, uh, there were some guidelines set to uh, enhance this kind of approach and promote it. Um, on the other side, there should be no disadvantages for women, because, you know, if the fact of working from home is not well integrated in the general working life, this would mean that women are uh, excluded uh, from uh, esempio, career opportunities eh, uh, and other mechanisms uh, in their day life. So, um, di that, would not be, uh, that would be a great disadvantage and penalty if you want for uh, women. So, on one hand, it's a great opportunity. On the other, in order for it to be smart, we need to have some measures taken. Um, gender equality would consider uh, this kind of element to uh, have the uh, best uh, possible uh, approach. Uh, um, and I would 
also like to say that there are some deans, school directors here, and I think that maybe they have some uh, questions uh, for you. So if you want, we are glad to listen to their questions or remarks. Well, very briefly, I would like to ask President Ricci. Uh, well, you mentioned that there's a uh, an opposition to the Invalsi tests, uh, um, which is mainly the maybe the result of uh, you know the fear of what a low score in the Invalsi test at school would mean. But in my opinion, um, a measure also taking a measure means a change. So the invalsi has become a new subject at school. There are books on the invalsi and uh, um, the invalsi, you know, takes away time from, for, from other subjects. So wouldn't it be better to go back to something different, maybe not really a score? an assessment, but maybe uh, a different system that changes year by year uh, to, to have a more objective measurement. And why do I say objective? Because maybe uh, students shouldn't study with a view of uh, passing the invalsi, but m more generally. Um, well, thank you for your question. And uh, let me say, first of all, that uh, uh, things have uh, um, radically improved in the course of time. So, um, you know, there have uh, uh, already been um, positive results. Uh, um, I work as a, in the area of statistics, and so uh, your remark and what you observed um, can be totally shared, but we have to show that this actually happens, that things go as you were saying, and we do not have data on that, uh, because apart from the experiences, the personal experiences that we may have, um, I can tell you that there are uh, positive, but also uh, negative experiences uh, from a personal point of view. So how can we, um, you know, study for the Invalsi test? Uh, because, okay, I might say, uh, let's try and do like you say, if then you have results, the economist would uh, tell me that there should be an objective to set, uh, and then we can try to do this kind of service, of exercise, sorry. But, you know, um, if the training has to do with the education in the broader sense, uh, and, uh, um, well, that's positive because, you know, tests uh, are based on national indications. And I would agree on the fact that, uh, you know, um, tests should ask uh, um, questions about, for example, the date of the unification of Italy, uh, because either I know it or not. Instead, if questions are asked about the skills, uh, that uh, are demanded. I think that it would be very difficult to do the imbalance in a different way. If you think of formulas, formulas. Uh, well, in this case, uh, formulas are there uh, because uh, they are provided, they are given within the test itself, so they don't need to know the formulas. And as for the um, approach, uh, um, I can say that every choice entails some negative and some positive aspects. Um, if we think of an example um, in terms of research and uh, uh, sampling, uh, which is something involved also in the methodological research and in the uh, making of this kind of uh, uh, identification, if you think of PISA, 
uh, this is the most problematic example. And my question, which is almost rhetorical, is um, school systems as such as the national one, or maybe also the uh, German one, and the uh, if you think of the PISA shock, uh, what kind of effects might there be within the school systems if schools are sampled and so participate after a sampling um, and so they should really make an effort uh, in this sense well in this case the, the important thing would be to find a balance to strike balance between the two things whereas the invalid tests do not have an impact on the career of the student but i need to know uh, at, at least um, uh, parts of this partially um, what kind of what, what students uh, are lagging behind uh, that's why there's this measurement at the end uh, of secondary school and if we take this kind of measurement we also certify that at that moment at that point that was the situation whereas the implicit drop out uh, starts from primary uh, school and so with the right balance uh, we should uh, try and get information on all students starting from a very early age so that we can find support measure very early what is also uh, true um, is that uh, we should find also compensation measures to make up for those results um, that uh, uh, have a negative impact on the system. Um, as for per my personal experience, uh, I can say that uh, the problem exists and we cannot hide it, but there's a much bigger problem that get us saying, uh, maybe this choice is not the uh, worst one. Um, and the, the biggest problem has to do with what is underneath the surface. Just to give you an example, all of us, well, we all know that uh, uh, regularly, on a regular basis, Italian newspapers at a certain point of the year um, publish the lists, the top slip, the lists of the top schools and the best and the worst schools uh, in Italy. Um, and I don't want to judge uh, something that I don't do, but I think that there is a strong thing here. There is an emptiness within the system, an empty area. And so if you leave that door open, that was the answer. So maybe the best answer is not just to, you know, take a stance which uh, uh, is uh, specific for one topic, but not for the other, and has to do and deals with a, a problem and not with the other. The society um, is radically changing, and uh, the school, uh, together with the teachers and, uh, um, you know, scholars in general, um, also changing but family need families need this kind of information so we should really try and strike a balance between what uh, we can measure thanks to robust data um, and the current situation so think um, what kind of uh, significant advantage we might have uh, with a standard test to have a positive effect so have a positive effect um, on, uh, you know, uh, resulting from the 200, 250 hours of schools. Uh, so um, that's something which is actually very um, reduced uh, second school. Uh, um, we are talking about three hours per week uh, and at maximum 99 hours overall. So not 250 yet we should have, but, uh, again, I think that uh, um, it's impossible to 
kind of training. To conclude, I would like to say um, it's very important um, and uh, very often it happens very often in the research. Um, it is very important to have data. So, you know, this is an independent sample that we have extracted and, uh, you know, what we have now is quite a big team, a big group, sort of a micro study, if you will. So students that already uh, passed the, the test for, let's say, organizational reasons. Now, the test that had been done six months earlier, so same test that done six months earlier, there is no significant difference between the those who did it already and the, uh, let's say, naive students. Um, I have to say that the real, you know, contribution to try and limit the negative effects that we can find, first of all, I'm talking about the communication with the school. This also requires what I have just said. This is what you said before. I mean, one of the reasons, not the only one, for thanks to which we've been able to do the test during the pandemic. First of all, the support of the government, otherwise that wouldn't have been possible. But, you know, the second element, if you will, that and this is my personal you know, opinion, I have met 7,000 schools uh, via the web, so in a one and a half months, so seven, eight short meetings a day, where uh, once again uh, we uh, we put our face on this and we explain schools why this was important. So if you do this, we are able to find I mean, the elements that you know put us together, which are much more numerous than those who represent differences between us. Thank you so much. Um, so once again, um, this is my you know, personal feedback on this kind of data because I was able to see the results of the tab being obtained thanks to the analysis and the research. And again, those who made the analysis and independent research, they have access to the uh, uh, social security data in Italy. There are so many things you can get from there, so many things you can really understand, and all of this is so useful for our life, but also for the well-being of millions of people, especially when you when you really have access to the census data. Otherwise, I mean, a sample data wouldn't be identified or detected. For example, you know, immigrants or immigrants integration issues, or the way we study from home, so in remote uh, teaching or remote learning. We haven't talked much about this uh, today, but I think we have to face this issue, uh, including, you know, working from home. So Mrs. Bonetti uh, talked about this before. I fear remote or uh, working from home is a, working from home, sorry, is a form of a discrimination from many people. So once again, we have plenty, plenty of data sets and data points otherwise nothing would be possible. I think there's a very large question because we should have closed it 10 minutes ago. Uh, the question is on dropout and monitoring or census. So this is a big issue. Now, my personal thought also has to do to uh, what we said today about the policy tests. So what about the real structural or restructuring of teaching systems, including census, advanced tests? So I agree on what you said. I mean, uh, remote schooling has saved school. It has moved, uh, you know, teachers, uh, you know, uh, let's say from, from their desks, so to say, so uh, they have learned the digital skills. Uh, but then we lost the real innovation of uh, didactics or teaching uh, skills. So uh, with no other lockdowns, I think this will be surpassed. So once again, uh, we need to build confidence and to be complete before share and co-plan. I think this is a topic still to be explored and the advanced tests are not, in my opinion, taking into account all of these uh, issues. I have a question on dropout, but this is one of the things that I worked on. Uh, we don't really have a specific, uh, you know, uh, 
snapshot about this. So it's a big issue because I mean the solution is the real tracking of the student. I mean, students, uh, uh, you know, drops out but then comes back in, and the solution is to do sort of tracking, just as if they had a microchip. So this is something which is not done. Uh, I think it's possible to do this. We also have some technical issues, once again, some red tape, some bureaucracy. First of all, we can be able, we have to be able to access data. But then we have to know that there are some education systems so working on two or three different levels. For example, vocational training, depending on the regional authorities. Well, they gather, they analyze that data with a language which is totally unique and different. These two systems have to be taken into account together because in many cases the dropout is from the, uh, let's say, uh, central schools to the vocational schools. So there's a lot of people from one system to another. Otherwise, we may have uh, many false positives or no positives at all. Now, uh, let me tell you very briefly that what you say is, uh, let's say, absolutely one of the current topics. But um, I'm always positive and uh, um, optimistic. So this is not due to embossing test. I have to say that our country has a, one of the best student census systems ever. So this is a key infrastructure that the country has. Many other countries don't have this. Okay, so once again, it's not my, it's not because of me, it's not thanks to me, okay? But, um, so 9.5%, now, uh, of course, I don't like it. I mean, uh, it, it makes me shake because I don't have other figures. I mean, to say that this is not true, but I'm sure that this is underestimating this phenomenon exactly uh, or even also because of the reasons that you've talked about them. So once again, let me be positive and optimistic, okay, when I speak about the future, well, we are working to change this because actually, in my opinion, we have three key solutions to be uh, worked on together. Let's say in the school system, after the uh, you know, high school diploma, vocational training and university system. So these are the three key points, and then of course, uh, well, uh, I think we have a fourth point, which is the you know the university um, dropout. Now, for the first the three points, uh, uh, we are very very close to uh, let's say to find the solution. So let's say we have aligned the three points. Okay, so this is great. I mean, uh, I'm quite you know optimistic because in a reasonable number of years, so hopefully months. Uh, there will be a final solution. So there will be a big step forward concerning the second point. I really would like to thank Anna Bonetti. I also would like to thank Roberto Ricci, in Bansi President. Also would like to thank all the speakers and discussants today. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being online. And uh, thank you for spending the uh, entire day. So. Uh, uh, we have skipped our coffee break at this afternoon. I hope this was interesting for all of you. Now, the material made for today's Congress will be made available on the website of the Foundation. So, of course, you can have uh, further information and insights. So, we have learned plenty of new things. So, of course, we are even more encouraged to go on. Also, we'd like to thank technicians and sound engineers today because we have a online connection plus the COVID social distancing. Really would like to thank Roberta Martaletti. Thank you so much. You are, let's say, behind the scenes of the uh, De Benedetti Foundation events. Next Thursday, we will have a lesson on one of the topics that uh, Mr. Von uh talked about uh, today. So next Thursday, a lecture at 5 p.m. once again in streaming and we will be talking about uh, children's the human capital and the uh, health issues of children so it's uh, a key interesting topic for all of you once again thank you so much bye bye